professionals across a range of disciplines in the geosciences. So you've got a chance to learn about all these different areas and hopefully it will help you to consider your professional focus moving forwards as well. There are a number of sessions being covered this afternoon, the first of which is mineral exploration, quarrying and mining commodities. Then there'll be a session on academia and postgrad pathways, followed by um, a video about publishing in the geosciences. There will be a break after that, so you get a chance to grab a cup of tea. And then there'll be a session on GIS and remote sensing, and the day will close with a session on further careers in geoscience. So you might be wondering who I am. I'm just going to quickly share a few slides with you to introduce myself. So bear with me a second. And hopefully you've all got that just now. I am Jessica Smith. I'm an engineering geologist. I work for Atkins, which is a large multidisciplinary engineering consultancy. And I'm also a member of council with the Geological Society. And for the past two and a half years, I've also been the vice president of the society, which is great fun, actually. I, um, like I say, I'm an engineering geologist at Atkins, but right now I'm actually seconded into SSE Renewables. And with SSE, I'm working on the Corrie Glass Pump Storage Hydroelectric Scheme. This is a super interesting project. It's the largest scheme of its kind to be developed in the UK for 30 years. So it's some quite groundbreaking things. And I get the opportunity to visit beautiful places in the Highlands, such as this spot here on a very sunny, but kind of chilly day up. Um, we're actually looking at some Monroe peaks in the background there. So quite high elevation. Now this area, Corrie Glass is particularly exciting for me as a geologist because it's located in the Great Glen of Scotland. Jessica, so, sorry yes. to interrupt, um, we can't it. see the screen. Oh, you can't see my screen? No. <laughs> oh, I don't know why. Let me try sharing again. It's saying it's sharing, I think. Let me try again. Oh, we can see it now. Is that working now? Yeah. Oh, cool. Right. Let me go back to Dazzle Yall with that photo there. So this is Cory Glass. This will be the area where the reservoir will be in the future. Um, and like I say, I feel quite fortunate to be able to, to visit locations like that through work. And it's particularly interesting for me because it's located in the Great Glen in Scotland. So one of the major structural boundaries that we have, which is, of course, famous for the Great Glen Fault, which gives rise to the topography through this area, which is dominated by a series of lochs and um, glens and all the mountains on either side. So quite a cool place to be working generally. But how did I come to be here where I am right now, seconded into SSE and working for Atkins? It hasn't always been a straight path and there's been some ups and downs along the way, which I don't mind admitting. Um, I started by studying earth science at the University of Glasgow. So that was between 2000 and 2004. And I actually hadn't applied to do earth science. I applied to do archaeology, um, but I didn't really enjoy that very much. So earth science was my second subject. And I took that forward for my degree, which I did. Um, but I graduated and I kind of had a panic. I didn't actually know what I wanted to do. So I took a job. I worked for a year um, in Glasgow still um, in the geo-environmental and geotechnical sector. But it was for a company that I, I you know, to be honest, I didn't really enjoy working where I was. And I, that was kind of one of my low points on the graph here in that particular first year of work, which was a bit rough coming fresh out of uni. But in order to kind of give myself a little bit of time to work out what I wanted to do and where I wanted to be, I saved up and I took a year out. I went to Canada. I was in Vancouver for a year, which was absolutely great fun. And another one of my high points I came back to the UK. Um, and I have to confess, I still still hadn't fully worked out what to do so I took a job with an engineering consultancy called Fairhurst and as it happens I really enjoyed that um, I was in Aberdeen for a while then I worked in the Edinburgh office and I was working on a range of projects but again it was like geo-environmental and geotechnical work and over the course of a couple of years I realized that I was actually more into the engineering geology side of things rather than the environmental stuff I didn't I hadn't studied chemistry at school my chemistry was really limited to the geochemistry I did in my degree so I didn't feel that I was best placed to be involved with you no know, land remediation projects and what have you. So I took myself off to London and I did my MSc in engineering geology at Imperial College. And I'm not going to lie, it was quite a tough year. I'd been out of formal education for a few years, as you can see. So it was a bit of a shock to the system to go back and do that. 
However, it was um, one of the best things ultimately that I could have done. It gave me a really solid understanding of the technical aspects of my now career. I met some great people, um, got to go on some really interesting field trips as well. But the MSD, I feel, really set me up for my career moving forwards. And I think it's pretty common for people in the geosciences to, to go on and do a, perhaps a more vocational or more tailored, focused um, master's subject after the quite broad degree, um, bachelor's degree that we tend to do. So after that year down in London, I joined TRL. I came back up to Scotland for that. And that was kind of a different type of, of job for me. It was very much um, research focused. So the engineering geology aspect there was landslide hazards. So in the UK and also across Europe. And I really enjoyed it. I got to go to meetings in um, all sorts of interesting places, Naples, Barcelona. Uh, I worked with a great range of people from all these establishments across Europe. But the research side of things just wasn't quite for me. I quite like a bit more of a practical day-to-day -day role, I guess. And so after a couple of years, I left TRL and I joined Golder Associates. With Golder, um, I really enjoyed the job. I was actually based in Gibraltar for most of the time. So I lived across the border in Spain and I was doing lots of rockfall protection work in Gibraltar. Gibraltar is a big lump of rock, basically. So you can imagine there's a lot of pressure on uh, land availability and protecting whether it's roads, housing or other infrastructure. I had an absolute blast. I loved living there. I loved the people I worked with. But the work was starting to get a little bit samey, so that's why I decided to move on and I joined Atkins. I moved back up to Scotland. I'm in Glasgow and I actually haven't looked back. Atkins has been really good for me. I wasn't too sure about joining such a big organisation, but ultimately that was quite a good move for me as a woman in, in engineering because big multidisciplinary engineering consultancies are very hot on all matters of EDI, um, equality, diversity and inclusion. So I've been fortunate enough to be involved in lots of different initiatives, which have helped me as a woman in engineering to develop and progress my career. So like I say, I'm still still with Atkins today and I'm, I'm very happy that I made that move. But I guess the thing that I would like you to take away from this is it hasn't been plain sailing along the way. There have been some ups and downs and times when I've really had to think long and hard about what I wanted to do next and whether or not I was actually happy in what I was doing. But the key thing is you can always try something else. It's, it's good to try things. And I've learned something at every stage of the process. And that's helped me to develop in my career and be a, the best geoscientist that I can really in engineering geology. So please don't ever feel like you need to know exactly where you're headed at the moment. And please do take the opportunity that you have today to learn a little bit more about options that are available to you. Now, before we get going with the sessions, a little bit of housekeeping. You will have noticed that your audio and visual have been disabled. Please do pop any questions that you have into the Q&A box. Um, I know that some of the previous sessions, there have been a huge number of questions, which is fantastic. The, the panelists love getting your questions. Um, if there are a lot, we might not be able to get all through all of them, but please don't let that put you off. Please do raise your questions. And before I hand over to our panelists, I just want to say a really big thank you to all of our speakers over the past couple of days and today. We really appreciate you volunteering your time. I would also like to thank the society staff who've done such an amazing job in setting up the past few days. Um, it's really appreciated. And also a big thank you to our platinum sponsors. They are Fugro and the University of Edinburgh School of Geosciences. So we really appreciate their support in getting initiatives like this off the ground. Without any further ado, I'm going to hand over to the panelists for your first session, which is in mineral exploration, quarrying and mining commodities. So I'll be passing over to Rose, Hugh, Jake and Alex. Thank you very much and enjoy your afternoon, everybody. Thank you, Jessica. And, um, and thank you, Becky, for, for inviting me. So let me just share my screen. Um, so I am, um, is that sharing right before I get going? Yeah, cool. Yeah. Um, so my name is, is Rose and I'm going to be the first speaker in this session. Um, and oh, there we go. Um, I'm kind of here with, with a few hats on really because I have a few different roles. So I am in the final throes of a PhD at the University of Leicester, which is in um, Applied Economic Geology, so the, the minerals and mining sector. Um, 
but I'm also co-founder of a not-for-profit called Responsible Raw Materials. And I actually met Becky through my role at Satana, um, where I do bits as a research associate and also um, a project manager. And my, my history is I, I did a MSci in geology at the University of Birmingham. Um, and I finished that in 2018. Um, so, so in terms of my, my first and foremost, first and foremost on a daily basis, I'm a PhD student at the University of Leicester. Um, I started or I looked at doing PhDs because my master's project was very focused on geochemistry. And I had a bit of a panic that I didn't really know what job I was going to get with that. So um, no one in my family had ever been to university and I had no idea what I was going to do. So at the last minute, I kind of applied for a few PhDs, which I thought might, might be able to, to use my geochemistry that I, I learned for my master's um, and apply it. So I ended up um, getting the, the PhD at Leicester, which has a very swish title of post subduction magnetism and mineralization, the Tabatu gold telluride deposit in Fiji. Um, but in normal terms, what my, my PhD does is I have a chapter which looks at the geochemistry of the magmatic rocks across Fiji. So that's obviously very similar to what I did at my master's. Um, then I have a chapter which looks at the Tabatu uh, gold telluride deposit. So I was very lucky to go out there and spend some time with my own one, um, logging core, um, just you know, working more as you would do in exploration. Um, so I was out there for six weeks and doing a very detailed study of the deposit. And then I also, um, and this was kind of a, an add-in because of COVID. So I was meant to do more kind of lab work, but then obviously everything shut last year. Um, so we added in a more desk-based chapter, which uses um, data from companies worldwide to assess whether byproducts, so basically commodities other than gold, can be sustainably produced from deposits such as, as this one in Fiji. Um, and this means that, you know, I get to do a whole host of, of very you know, different um, day-to-day -day activities. So no two, well, certainly pre-COVID, no two days really look the same, which I have enjoyed. I mean, a PhD has been hard going, especially with all the challenges, you know, with, with lab closures and stuff. But I have got to do lots of, of very random and different things and really gain experience in lots of different aspects. So the research aspect, of, as I said, I've got to do field work in, in Fiji, which was pretty awesome. Um, but generally also spend a lot of time in the labs data analysis which it sounds very grand but just means lots of time looking at excel and maybe doing some modeling um, and obviously writing um, but i've also got to you know talk at conferences like um, at mgsg which is at the nhm which was you know awesome and go to places like colorado for conferences um, i've been to spain teaching the undergraduates which was very fun i've got to say if you Besides to do a PhD, field work is much better when you're not being assessed. You're there in a, in a more fun capacity. I'm not sure I really enjoyed field work at undergraduate level. I know a lot of people think that it's the best aspect, um, but not having the pressure of, you know, 10, 11 p.m. deadlines <laughs> makes it much nicer. Um, and I also do a lot of outreach as well. Um, the other roles and the other bits I kind of dabble in, um, as I said, um, project manager at Satala um, and co-founder of Responsible Materials. And they, they mesh quite nicely because I, Responsible Materials came out of an internship with Satala actually. So as part of my PhD funding, I have to do um, an internship with, with a company and it can't be related to my PhD. So Satala is actually, um, primarily it's a risk consultancy company, but about 50% of their work is within mining. Um, and they do a lot of um, sustainability consulting work with mining companies and, and training and teaching as well. Um, so I'd, I'd organised this internship with Satala and then COVID happened. So everything, the internship returned online and we decided to hold um, an online conference actually. And that snowballed into what is now a not-for-profit called Responsible Materials. We hold 
an annual conference. So we've had people from all over the world come and talk about sustainability within the mining sector, first and foremost. Um, and we also held a, a roundtables at the start of the year, which brought together professionals from the different mining codes and standards. So Jork, Perth, um, we had someone from China speak, someone from Mongolia speak. So get to do all of the, the liaising with those people. Um, and we also do some training as well. So through Sitala Responsible Materials, we did some um, introduction to mining training for MP researchers, which was pretty cool. Um, so on a daily basis, I have a very, very mixed bag. Um, and I'm kind of happy to answer questions about all of it. I'm not sure that my experience has been normal, but it's definitely been varied. Um, and, you know, I, I do a lot of different stuff as well. So can kind of, because I work on the interface between academia and industry, I think have a different take to a lot of people. Um, I have no intention of staying in academia once I finish my PhD, which is different to a lot of people because obviously most people do a PhD because they want to, to stay in academia. So I think I will probably have a very different take on it to the people who might be in the panel later on today. Um, I am very lucky because of this mix of things I get to do and I get to meet so many different people and you know make my own timetable and work on my own terms which a lot of people don't have um and I also get the freedom to do lots of other stuff as well so through the university I did the the mineral exploration session for girls into geoscience so I got to play with rocks with a lot of girls aged kind of eight to ten um and that was great fun um, I also, I don't know if anybody's heard about this, but do letters to a pre-scientist. So anybody who works within STEM can sign up to this and you become a pen pal for a, um, a school child in um, America. And that's that's really interesting as well. Um, and as a PhD student, I do the Brilliant Club. So I go into schools and teach um, either GCC or A-level students about the mining industry. So a very mixed bag there too. Um, I think throughout all of these roles, some, some key pointers come out as things that are helpful. Um, obviously, subject knowledge within geology is helpful and technical skills. But I think throughout all of these different roles, I've appreciated much more how important, you know, people call them soft skills, but I think they're more, you know, skills that can be applied in, in a range of, of areas. So project management and communication and teamwork. I think are often undervalued um, and actually these are the skills that have meant that I've been able to do my work through to and responsible materials with experience outside of industry um, but also creativity and problem solving because in all of these roles there's I mean especially with COVID so many challenges that, that present themselves that it's just been you know the problem solving skills that come with the masters and doing geology especially I think geologists often don't realize that because of the nature of the data we deal with we're very good at problem solving and kind of extrapolating data um, and I think that makes us very good in a range of roles we don't necessarily automatically think of um, but then also having initiative and self-accountability certainly with the PhD and the extra bits and pieces I do, having the push to do it, you know, when there's no one breathing down your neck telling you you have to meet deadlines, sometimes it can be a little bit easy to, you know, wander off, especially when you're working from home. Um, so, yeah, those are the things that came to mind when I was thinking about what's helpful in these roles. And then just a recap of kind of how I got here. It looks very neat and tidy, I have to say. Um, but it has not felt like that. So my PhD had nothing to do with what I did at my undergraduate. I ended up having to do a kind of like crash course in mineral exploration studies. So I'd never done a module on it when I started this PhD. So it was a it was a bold move, I think, kind of taking it on. Um, and it's been a learning curve. Um, but I think you know I wouldn't change anything and I think the skills I've learned and the people that I've been able to meet has been you know I've been incredibly incredibly lucky um and yeah I'm happy to 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 kind of talk about any of it because there's a lot going on on that timeline I understand 
<laughs> I'm a very busy bee at times. Um, so yeah, I think that's me. And if anybody wants to add me on LinkedIn or Twitter, I'm more than happy to answer questions on any and all of that and connect with people. Um, so yeah, that's me. Thank you. Okay, I think uh, it's me up next. So I'll just share my screen as well. Screen number two. Uh, share. Let me know if that appears for yourselves. Yep, smashing. Okay. Right. Uh, well, firstly, I'd, I'd echo the sentiments of the previous speaker. So thank you very much to Joel Salt for the opportunity to speak today. Uh, and this is just to give an introduction to myself and uh, help uh, maybe guide some questions that we can get later on. So to briefly introduce myself, my name is Hugh. I am a chartered exploration geologist with about seven years of experience, having had the, the opportunity to work in lots of different countries, primarily across uh, Africa, but also the like server, Australia and Fiji as well. Um, I am currently working as an exploration and mining geologist for a company called Nordgold on their Bissabuli gold mine out in a central northern Burkina Faso. And my, uh, my geological career sort of started back in 2010 when I did a four year undergraduate degree at Royal Holloway University um, in vanilla geoscience. I tried to get into uh, the mining industry because that's what my passion was at the time. I couldn't manage to do it. So then I realized that I needed to do a little bit more further study. And that's when I went to do an MSc in mining geology at Camel School of Mines in 2016. So as far as my current job goes, uh, my, my official title at the moment is management trainee. And that's primarily because I'm working on a fast track leadership development program for the company whereby we will get exposure to all the different facets of exploration, resource and mine geology um, with the idea of becoming uh, or moving into managerial positions at the end of the, the three year program. And there's sort of two work streams that I'm currently involved in at the moment. So the first one, as mentioned, is getting exposure to the whole work process of a mine. And this includes things like uh, all the way at the grassroots stage, managing and designing and implementing our exploration programs from early, uh, early stage reconnaissance work through to our drilling campaigns, then moving on into contributing to resource and geological modeling that we require in order to define our mineral resources subsurface. And then the last step is actually helping to contribute to the mine geology operation side of things, defining where our zones of ore and, and high and low grade are and assisting the mining department with actually extracting that material out of the ground. So that's the first stream. Now, the second stream is also quite unique and quite varied, which is to do with business improvement. So one of my roles is to look at our current workflows, primarily within exploration, but also within the other departments as well, and looking at how we do things and how we can improve doing those things, either through streamlining or perhaps uh, reducing cost or increasing revenue, just to improve our workflows and make us a more efficient company. So that means, uh, similar to Rose, we've got quite a, a diverse range of day-to-day -day activities, and it means that no two days are the same, which is always something to, to get out of bed for. So in terms of skills that might be useful if someone is potentially interested in, in pursuing a similar career path, the first thing I'd say is, as an exploration of mine geologist, you have to have a, a fairly multifaceted skill set, and you end up being a bit of a jack-of-all-trades and a master of none, but you get to be involved with lots of different stuff. So the first one probably sounds a bit obvious. Uh, geoscience is a useful skill. But I highlight this because it's not just one area of geoscience. It's pretty much the whole range. And we're talking about your standard geology, looking at rocks and minerals, uh, being able to identify zones of alteration, mineralization, a bit of geodynamics, uh, plate tectonics also comes into play here, as well as things like your geochemistry, working out what, uh, what's in the rocks you're looking for, whether you've got any economic grades of the metals of interest, and also things like geophysics which you only typically touch on at university, but is very, very important for our subsurface exploration campaigns. So again, that's that sort of multifaceted using lots of different data in order to create a target and then go and test it during your exploration campaigns. The second useful skill is, is field work. And this is, I think, probably fairly unique to uh, exploration and mining because it's one of the few subsectors of geoscience which still requires lots of field work. So if you like being in the outdoors um, and hopefully in some slightly more exotic places than Scotland and Wales that some universities take you to, you do get to have the, the opportunity to travel some really interesting places around the world, places you otherwise might not be able to travel to as a tourist. And also then just being able to go out, have a look at rocks, conducting things like geological mapping, which you might be doing in your second and third year um, at university, conducting uh, geochemical surveys, geophysical surveys, and then uh, looking at drilling rigs as well, logging core, and then coming up with your defined mineralization. 
So a third useful set of skills would be software. Now, this is coming more to the forefront, uh, say, over the last 10 years or so. Um, but in exploration and mining, we've been a bit of a slow start, but we're starting to adopt new uh, software um, packages more and more so. So the two big groups, the one is a 2D um, uh, mapping software. So you've got GIS, which is Geographical Information Systems. And this is mapping software where you can uh, create and add on different layers, uh, like an overhead projector, if you like. And then you can use that to compile and synthesize all of your data. And then ones on the right hand side are our 3D modeling software, such as Leapfrog, Datamine and Micromine. And this is where we can take our 2D data, turn it into a 3D model, add in our drill holes, and we can make a subsurface geological model. So you have, if you have any opportunity to develop these sorts of skills at university, particularly as a lot of universities have uh, licenses for free for students to use, try and get some data uh, from perhaps your professor or your lecturer and have a bit of a play around because these are really useful. And I think between about 75 and 80% of all jobs for geologists require or desire some sort of 2D or 3D geological mapping software, okay? And then the final skill set I'd recommend would be useful for this type of role is something, something quite logistical like handyman skills. So can you wire a plug? Can you set up a campsite? Can you organize how many vehicles you've got? Uh, can you sort out samples going to and from your campsite to the lab? Can you organize your own travel to and from site? There's lots of different things that day to day are not technical skills that you need, but will be very helpful for you uh, when you are trying to go about your exploration campaigns. There's nothing worse than uh, getting into the field, having a blown tire and then not having any idea on how to fix it. So any sort of additional skills, um, things like Duke of Edinburgh would be very useful um, for this sort of thing. Okay. And then finally, just to uh, explain my, my timeline. So as I mentioned, I, I did a four year undergraduate geoscience degree in uh, just vanilla geoscience at Royal Holloway University of London. And I actually started on a three year degree. I was just doing the BSc. And uh, the, the only reason I changed to a four year because I wanted to spend another year at uni, to be honest. That was literally the only reason. But during that period of time, I managed to grab a couple of internships uh, out in Australia to give me a bit of a, uh, exposure to the mining industry and exploration side as well. And when I was going through university, the, the mining industry was booming. And I was being told that, oh, yeah, you'll find a job. You'll be able to bag loads. It'll be absolutely fine. And then as soon as I left, everything crashed. And there were virtually no jobs available whatsoever. So when I left, I had to, actually had to jump ship. And I went into the oil and gas business, working for a company called Deloitte up in London. And we were basically doing data analysis. And I spent about a year doing that. But after about six to six to eight months, I felt, you know what, this really isn't for me. I want to get back into the field. I want to do geology. I want to get my hands dirty. Um, and because the mining industry was still slightly depressed at the time, the commodities were very low in prices. I realized that my MSI was not good enough for me to land a job. So I decided to go down to Camon School of Mines in order to do an MSc in mining geology, upskill myself get some more vocational focused training in mining because it, in my undergrad, I'd only had like a single module in third year. And that was enough for me to then bag a full-time job with a company called Alta Strategies uh, at the end of my MSc. Now I'd actually worked with them uh, for a little bit of time beforehand, only because the, uh, the CEO, the director and about three of the four geologists had all gone to Campbell School of Mines to do an MSc in mining geology. So sometimes it's not just what you learn, it's who you actually find uh, you can connect with. And that can also help you land a job, particularly in our sector. So I work with uh, Alta Strategies. It was a small exploration junior company. It's based in southern, uh, southern Oxfordshire, but they have multiple projects in multiple jurisdictions out in various countries in Africa. So I got the opportunity to, again, sort of design and plan and support uh, all these different varied uh, exploration campaigns in the likes of Ethiopia. Uh, uh, we had Cameroon, uh, Liberia, Mali, Cote d'Ivoire, Morocco fantastic early stage exploration experience, which totally invaluable for a geologist uh, at the early stage of their career. And actually in August of 2020, uh, I decided to move into my current role, uh, joining Norgold's uh, fast track development program as an exploration geologist, at least for the first year. And uh, that's also when I managed to get chartered through the Geostock of London as well. So that's what of me in a nutshell, uh, hopefully it gives you a bit of an idea of uh, what, I've, what I've done and how I've got to where I am. Uh, if you'd like to connect on LinkedIn, feel free, please do. Uh, my email is down the bottom as well. If you'd like to send an email in follow-up, we don't manage to get to all the questions today as a panel. Um, but I think I'll leave it there and I'll, I'll hand over to our next speaker. So thank you very much. Thanks, Hugh. And hopefully I can try and 
have something as interesting as that. So uh, bear with me while I just put this up on the screen. Can we all see that? Just let me know when. Great stuff. Um, so my name's Jake Kane. I, uh, I've had a slightly choppy and changey career, um, starting off as a geologist um, in exploration and mining in, in Mozambique and a little bit in Zambia. And then sort of retrained myself, re like picked up some new skills. And then um, I'm now I'm working in the business development team of a, a company called Sabanya Stillwater. So sort of two, two sides to my background, two strings to my bow. And one is geology and technical, and the other is uh, financial. So yeah, I work for Sabanya Stillwater, which are a large mining company, which are based out of South Africa. They're predominantly in the gold and PGM space. Um, they've also got some mines in the USA. And so my role in the business development team, and I'll try and speak to it as much as I can, but I only joined there two weeks ago. So I'm trying to find out as much about the role as, as probably you are. Um, and so what I know about my role at the moment is that as a team, we're trying to grow our business through, through various acquisitions of, of other companies and try and move into a, a space which is going to grow the business into sort of battery materials. So lots of commodities ranging from copper, cobalt, and nickel, lithium. That's the sort of space that we want to be in. So, so my role in the business development team is working on those sort of acquisitions. And I think my background as a, as a geologist is quite an important foundation for what I do on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, I'll caveat that by saying that I'd never envisaged myself being in the position that I'm in now. Um, and that probably will be the takeaway from, from this is that if you're starting off in exploration, you in five, 10 years time, you'll probably be in a completely different, um, in, in a completely different role to what you expected. So, so the sort of work I do on a day-to-day -day basis, um, it, it ranges from identifying companies and being in meetings with other companies and trying to understand their business. So that's really where my technical background um, really helps me. So looking at the geology of the mines, their resource models, and the sort of work that Hugh would do, we'd be reviewing from a sort of uh, company strategy point of view, and then looking at engineering, mineral processing, um, and some financial stuff. And actually our department is completely diverse in terms of skill sets. So um, we're quite a small team, but we're full of lawyers um, and ex-financial advisors. Um, we, we're mining engineers in the team, and I'm, I'm the only geologist by background. Um, so completely diverse, but um, quite an interesting group of people. And so the sort of technical skills that I've sort of picked up over the last, uh, the last few years, I think they're, they've been quite important for me. And I never envisaged picking up those sort of skills. I always started with geology, but I think over time while I was working um, with a company called Gemfields, I'll come to that just after. Um, I ended up over time picking up some experience in, um, and working with a lot of people who were mining engineers and mineral processing engineers, um, working with the finance department and corporate sustainability teams. So really picking up a lot of skills on a day-to-day -day basis, which um, you know, I never, never thought I would be in that sort of position. Um, but then also after I left Gemfields, I retrained in, in finance. Um, I did a master's in uh, metals and energy finance at Imperial College in London. And I think there I sort of fused the technical skills with a side to the industry, which I'd never been exposed to, which was uh, valuations and finance and, um, you know, a huge part of the industry, which as a geologist, I never really understood. So pulling the two of those together really has helped me in the, the role that I've got now at Sibania so far. Um, but I also I try to get involved with as many um, different organizations as possible. So obviously the GeoSOC and IM3. Um, they're the sort of technical professional associations that, that I like to work with. And then also trying to give myself continuous learning. So um, I'm quite a believer in never stop learning and always try and pick up new skills as you go along. So trying to um, prepare myself for, for an exam, some examinations in the corporate um, uh, in, in the financial analyst, analyst um, examinations. And so, yeah, they're the sort of the background skills. But I think also what's quite important is um, doing some networking and getting out and meeting people. And I think that's ultimately how my career has developed is by meeting new people and hearing about through exactly platforms like this, different careers that are out there uh, for you. And so my, 
my uh, career path, as I said, is chopped and changed a little bit, but I did my an undergraduate in geology at the University of St. Andrews. Um, and throughout that, tried to pick up as much experience as I could in various different internships. So one with a geophysics internship, working on some oil and gas um, data. One as a field geophysicist, just after I left, left university. And the other for a company called Aggregate Industries. Um, and so those last two internships, actually, I, I'd already been offered a role at Gemfields as an exploration geologist. But due to various complications in getting out there, I had about six months until I got my visa to, to leave. And so um, I think picking up as much experience as I could, wherever it was, paid, unpaid, was really important for me and actually um, was quite an important um, part of my pitch to Gemfields when I was trying to get a role was that I'd done some, some internships beforehand. And so my role at Gemfields was quite interesting. I worked on the, the only and the largest um, ruby mine in the world. And so twofold worked on both the mining geology side and on the exploration geology side, um, which was an incredible experience. And I, I learned so much by just being on the ground every single day, standing by drilling rigs or standing in the mine, um, working with mining engineering teams and mineral processing teams. And so that was a really fascinating experience. Um, but then I, I think I realized that actually I wanted to diversify my skill sets a bit more. Um, I'd been living in Mozambique for three years and I thought time for a little bit of a change. So I came back and retrained in finance. Um, and from there, like Hugh also joined Deloitte, but probably on a different side of Deloitte to, to where he was working on the sort of data analyst side. So I was in the advisory corporate finance business and um, working directly with mining clients. And so that was also a really interesting part of my role because I was able to go and visit clients um, all around the world in Russia, um, in the UAE, um, in, in Zambia, um, the DRC, all over the place, which was really great experience because then instead of just being looking at one mine, I could see many different mines, many different projects, meet different people, um, which really, again, helped me learn from the people around me. Um, and, and then I was continuing with that and um, an opportunity came up to join Sabane and in, in a role in business development which you know back in 2016 when I picked up a job in exploration uh, I never envisaged myself to to be going down that sort of route so I think in summary um, I've sort of picked up a, a, a few skills I'm a jack of all trades and master of none sorry Hugh I'll steal that from your slides but um, I think it's true I think um, trying to pick up as much skills as possible in as many different areas, um, I think that gives you uh, uh, some really great experience which you can take forward. So, yeah, my my final comment would be: you won't know where you're in in five, in ten years time. So, don't look too far ahead. Just uh, carry on with what you're doing now. And then I think Alex, up to you. Okay, thank you very much. I'll just share my screen. Let me know when you can see something. Um, there we go. Can we? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. Okay. Thanks very much, Jake. Um, I'll, I'll take it from here. So, hello, everyone. My name is Alex Christopher. Um, I'm a former exploration geologist with about two and a half, three years experience. Um, I'm currently working as a multi-commodity analyst at uh, Crew International or CRU International, uh, which is a market intelligent, uh, sorry, market and business intelligence uh, business uh, based in London, focused on mining metals and fertilizer industries. Uh, much like Jake, I've only started this job very recently, slightly longer. I've been in the job for about three and a half months now. Um, so I am also kind of still learning the role, but I'll do my best to take you through what I understand currently. Um, I did a MSci in Geoscience with the Year of International Study at, at, at the Royal Holloway University of London, uh, much uh, similar to Hugh. And then after that, um, I went to uh, Campbell School of Mines, same as Hugh, um, uh, to do an MSc in Mining Geology course in uh, 2018. Um, so my, as, as we go through this, my kind of uh, journey or part, uh, career path is very much one of uh, the field uh, and, and going behind and, and ended up behind the desk. So kind of the first half of Hugh's journey and the second half of uh, Jake's journey, <laughs> I think. There we go. So move on. So yeah, as an exploration geologist, um, I worked for a private equity group called Prefera Private Equity. Uh, they had uh, subsidiaries based uh, and products based across the globe. Um, in my two and a half, three years working with them, I spent time in uh, seven jurisdictions, um, including Arizona, as you saw on the previous slide there, 
Sweden, Norway, Montenegro, Serbia, and the Republic of Ireland. Um, so in that uh, amount of time, I managed to uh, pack quite a few things. And obviously that covered uh, several different commodities, uh, gold, silver, lead, zinc, uh, copper, and cobalt. So I did quite well, I think, yeah, to cram it in that time. Now, as a part of this job, obviously a big part of it is research. So before you, you, know, you, enter, you enter an area, uh, not just the geology, which obviously is you know, the kind of crux of uh, what you know what we're doing. You need to look at the, you know, the communities, uh, you know the rules and regulations, and things like that, etc. So you would spend quite a lot of time at the desktop, you know, uh, uh, researching and reviewing these things. Uh, community engagement, as I said, is a huge part, uh, particularly nowadays. Uh, I'd say in the past, maybe the mining industry has maybe overlooked this area. Um, but certainly, if you're exploring in Europe, um, it's it's key. You will not get anywhere um, without engaging properly uh, with the community, um, explaining what it is that you're doing. If you obviously mining can be a slightly destructive thing, uh, you know, in the short term and obviously in the long term in some cases as well. But you need to kind of explain, you know, why we're doing these things and obviously what benefit of those things will be to the community and, and going forward. And also, um, as an exploration geologist, that'll be my job. You know, if a mine does come along, kind of explaining kind of what, how things would work around that, um, you know, rehabilitating the area, opportunities for locals and things like that as well. And obviously field work, huge part. Um, so uh, as I said, I was lucky enough to work across uh, different areas. I was also lucky to work across different climates. So I spent uh, two months in the Arizona desert. That was quite hot. I spent two months um, up in uh, the Arctic Circle of Norway. That was quite cold. Um, so it's very versatile and very dynamic in that sense as well. And it was uh, you know, one of the best, one of the great experiences in my life so far. And as you know, as a young person going into this, it's great to obviously see these things while you're young and free. Um, but I think one of the things that, um, which I get onto why I moved job, is obviously it can be quite a um, you know all-consuming job. Uh, and we'll get onto that in a moment. So in my current job as a multi-commodity analyst um, at CRU, so. Um, my my main my main role is uh, is kind of running the day to day of Crew's uh, partnership exclusive partnership with Fitch Ratings. Fitch Ratings is a credit rating agency. Um, so if many many of you may, may be too young, I don't know, but the financial crisis of two thousand and eight, you would have seen on the news about credit rating agencies downgrading countries' debt. Fitch was one of those companies, but also in the mining industry, obviously, to kind of take things, you have to, you know, you have to take on debt. So uh, there's a huge role for Fitch and other credit rating agencies in rating such companies, which obviously, if they give them a good rating, it's going to give them more access to debt, more access to, uh, to money to do what they uh, want to do. So one of the key things I do is cost curve analysis. I won't go too deep into that now, but if there's questions about that, I'll talk about that after. Uh, market Outlook, so I provide uh, Market Outlook's um, dashboards to Fitch across uh, 23 commodities, um, you know, your main ones, uh, gold, silver, things down to lithium, fertilizers, things like that. And obviously data analysis is a huge, huge thing uh, that I do, um, obviously as a market business intelligence company. This is, you know, this is, you know, this is what we focus on across the analysis division and even consulting as well. Um, so, for example, here's just a few uh, graphs I put in here. So, here at the top there is the CRU metal uh, metal basket that tracks some key metals, obviously, uh, you know, across time. So, as you can see, obviously, um, over the last uh, 12 months or so, it's been a bit of a crazy time for commodities. Um, we have this uh, heat chart here. This is something we give to clients. So, you know, what's going to be hot in the next uh, year, two years, etc., and things like that. Now, on to kind of useful skills. So uh, Hugh and Jake and, and Rose, uh, Rose have uh, talked about this. So I'm going to talk about skills that I've picked up and also ones that uh, would be useful to, for you to look at in the meantime while you're going through university and things like that. So as Hugh talks about IAGAS, uh, QGIS, these kind of geo software, um, geo software, uh, uh, geo software. Now, um, obviously, in my old job, I use this quite a lot, um, mapping, uh, remote sensing, things like that. In my new job, not so much of an application, but it, I think the skills and kind of um, assessing things that comes from that have um, helped me in uh, some things in my new job as well. Excel, uh, Rose uh, said, uh, talked about this, I believe. Yeah, I spend 90% of my time um, in this job at Excel. Excel is your friend. It can do amazing things. Um, you, know, you might think you're an expert, but I'm sure there's some sort of formula or, you know, some sort of macro, whatever that you don't know. So, you know, if you've got time to kind of you know, take an extra course or focus some time on Excel, I would say even for a field job or working behind the desk like I do, it's a, it's a crucial thing. Uh, um, uh, Garmin Basecamp, that's just a kind of GPS uh, kind of service thing. So that was useful when I was in the field. Think Cell, 
that's a very data linked thing. Um, so for example, when I'm making these cost curves, um, ThinkCell basically acts as a bridge between Excel and the nice pretty PowerPoint uh, that you see there. And uh, um, uh, Jake's uh, nodding his head there. Uh, it saves a lot of time, I, I believe. Um, and for me, uh, Salesforce and Jira, so obviously there is a, a client facing element of, of my job. So uh, Jira is a good way to kind of manage uh, workflows Salesforce, you can kind of track uh, uh, workflows, but also with that as well, you can obviously track sales, uh, customer interaction, things like that. And I've added in there uh, Python. Now, this is something that I don't currently use in my job, but I think uh, coding and learning some sort of code and kind of programming is a crucial thing uh, in the geosciences uh, nowadays and also going forward into, into geoscience careers, uh, be it for the field or be it for uh, a job like mine at the moment. And I've added in the uh, CFA Institute, I saw uh, Jake had that on his um, uh, slides as well. I'm currently uh, about to start, the, there's like a foundation program. Um, obviously, if that goes well, I'll, I'll go on to do the full thing. But if you are in the kind of analyst or financial analyst world, you know, that's the kind of thing, that's an equivalent to you being a chartered geologist um, uh, in, in, um, in, the, in the field. And then just to kind of finish off my career path. So it started in 2013. So I said I went to Royal Holloway um, uh, just like you did, but I spent a year abroad at the University of Toronto. And I initially entered Royal Holloway um, with the thought that I was going to end up in oil. And that was all the rage at the time. Um, and then I spent a year at the University of Toronto. Obviously, Canada is a huge mining centre, and um, that pretty much changed my, my outlook uh, instantly. Um, so once I came back from the University of Toronto, I was like, right, I'm going to be uh, a miner of some sort. I still wasn't sure, would I be an experienced geologist? Would I be a, you know, an engineer? Etc. That soon, uh, I soon sorted that out. Um, and I, I'd like who again, I went to the uh, Cambon School of Mines, did an MSc in mining geology. Um, while there, obviously got many opportunities to um, yeah, see uh, different parts of the world. I think I went to Namib Namibia, for example, and things like that. Um, in bad of experience as well, again, engaging with the community there and also kind of engaging in what is a very different uh, mining uh, space than, for example, in Europe. I then did an internship um, with Blytheway, which was actually facilitated by Canmore School of Mines. I spent some time at the investment uh, um, bank, uh, well, investment uh, company, uh, WH Hand Limited, and also the uh, nominated advisor, which is a, um, a body that you need to list yourself on the um, London um, AIM market, uh, Strand Hansen. And then I entered the work with Plethora Equity and, and the subsidiaries you can see there uh, for the two and a half, three years. And then ended up uh, where I am now at CRU. Um, I would say as well. So at CRU, um, we have a uh, we've just we've just launched a uh, kind of internship program. So obviously, if people are interested in that, you know, please talk to me. If you have any further questions about what it is to be a multi commodity analyst or any questions beyond that, please don't hesitate to contact me. Thank you for listening. Thanks everyone. Um, so we'll start with um, some questions. So I can see there's a question in the Q&A box already. Um, so I'm going to throw it to all of you. Is it possible to have a geological career in mining without travel and field work? Um, E.g. desk based as a resource GIS analyst and if so, how in demand are these roles in mining? Shall I go or who? Yeah, go Alex, first, Alex. Yeah, go on. Yeah, um, yes, um, I, I would say. Uh, so if you are interested in what you said there, so uh, GIS or resource geologist. So when I was an exploration geologist, we actually had an in-house person who exclusively stayed uh, at the desk, uh, didn't enter the field. Um, and I would say, and I'm sure Hugh can, and, and others can talk to this as well, um, as much as I did some of that work myself, it was very helpful to have someone dedicated to that. Um, so you would be in, you'd be very in demand, a very good resource to any any exploration uh, company or mining company, uh, for that matter. Um, I would say, um, you know, when you're so you, obviously you start behind the desk. I mean, it, you may get invited out, um, but I think you you can certainly kind of uh, survive staying behind the desk. And have no issue. Um, because, you know, as much as obviously as a field geologist, I feel you need to go in the field to do the remote sensing, to do the kind of resource uh, geology, you don't, you don't really need to be in the field. So, yeah, in short, 100% you can do that without all the travel. 
Yeah. Yeah. Go on, I'd agree. Go on, Jake. You go. No, I'd agree that, that there's a lot of mining companies out there who, who offer roles, um, even based in London, um, where you're doing analysis of all of their mines around the world and um, opportunities and markets. So, yeah, absolutely. I'd, I'd say they're, they are available. Um, I don't know how how hotly demanded they are and how many people are competing for them, but there's definitely a roles around. Yeah, and I'd, uh, I'd just follow up. I'd agree with the other guys. Yeah, they are definitely those roles available. They're probably not as plentiful as your standard bread and butter geologist roles um, because sometimes the individual company might not have a specialist or enough budget for a specialist in GIS, for example. Um, another thing to perhaps consider is particularly when it comes to the resource uh, geology side, those roles typically can require a few years of experience before you can get into them. And that might be experience you need to get whilst you are working as an exploration geologist or on a mine site. Um, the GIS or modeling um, software skills would definitely be very useful. There are specialist um, roles available, um, but I think they are probably, there are fewer of them available and probably slightly a little bit more in demand because they have the perk of allowing you to be based near your home and not being in the field on a six free rotation. Rose, do you have anything to add to that? Not that I have anything No. Great. Um, well, there's uh, more questions coming in, which is great. So um, please um, submit further questions to the Q&A box. Um, so someone's asking um, if any of you can recommend um, good companies to approach for internships. Um, where would you start with that? Um, can you recommend um, anyone? Yeah. Um, so, well, my first question to that question would be, uh, is, are, are you looking for a field role or are you looking for a finance, uh, um, you know, market intelligence thing? So, but from my point of view, so yeah, CRU, for example, um, no, no, uh, you know, we, we said we have an internship program that is active um, and we'll, um, it's a new thing this year, but it's, it's gone well. So we're doing it in the future. Um, they will be uh, summer internships. Uh, they can last from a month to, to three to six months. Um, so obviously that will be a kind of a data, data analyst or research analyst uh, role. Um, in terms of uh, field, I think uh, obviously uh, who may be better a uh, place for this, but I know um, when, I was, when I was looking for internships, things like that, you can, uh, some, of, some of the bigger companies, so you know, your bigger, you know, Rio Tinto, that type of thing, um, you know, you can send things in, but I think you're probably better to aim for a kind of like a mid-tier kind of junior company um, and offer time, you know, um, hi, you know, can I, you know, can I spend a, a, you know, a few weeks in, you know, wherever it may be and approach that way? Um, because I think in, in terms of actually active uh, advertising of uh, internships, it's not a huge, huge thing. It's a, you, you probably need to approach them. Whereas in the space that I'm in, we will advertise them and it will be there. Yeah, there's companies like uh, Golden Star Resources, which is one that comes to mind. And they work quite closely with women in mining each year to um, bring in three or four interns um, from women in mining in London uh, to their operations over the summer. But what I would say is those opportunities are advertised very far in advance um, because the logistics to get your visas and stuff takes takes quite a long time. So be on the lookout a long, a long way before the summer break because it's about now that they're advertising them. And, and Alex was spot on about um, the bigger companies, typically, at least in exploration, not, there aren't many advertised internships. It is the smaller companies you have to actively go and approach. Um, I'm going to throw the name of Alta Strategies out there. Perhaps the director and CEO aren't going to like me for that if it gets banned. But um, they have taken uh, interns in the past, not only through the Women in Mining Scheme that Jake just mentioned, but also uh, just broadly more across the board. Um, so they might be worth looking into. And if you're looking for companies you don't know where to start, a um, bit of advice I've given in the past is if you go to the London Stock Exchange website, uh, if you look around on there, you can find an Excel spreadsheet, which will basically give you all of the companies listed on there. And you can then filter and sort by basic commodities and mining metals. And you basically get an A to Z list of all the mining companies listed in them. Um, so that's a good way to actually find out who's out there. It's just a case of going down the list and one by one, hitting up all the different companies out there. And just to add to that from experience, I think the big companies because they advertise specific internships, it can be very difficult for them to be more flexible. So like with my PhD, I had to do an internship, but I only offered internships to master students. And I, some of the bigger mining companies just could not 
work out how to fit a PhD student into that, that model. Um, and they also, some internships, because they pay you, they have to be a little bit stricter with what they offer. So if you want an internship with something that's perhaps outside of your comfort zone, they won't necessarily pay you for you to get that education. Whereas if there's something that you want to do um, that is outside of your comfort zone, reaching out and asking for an internship is a great way to do it. So I you know, reached out to Satala and I really landed very luckily with it because it's a small company. They could let me kind of have a play and have a feel for the different parts of the industry that I enjoy. Um, so yeah, definitely smaller companies. It's a bit more time consuming because you have to research more and really perhaps think about what you want to do more, but I would think it's worth it in the long term. Great, um, so we've got more questions coming in. Um, one question is probably quite a fast one to answer. How big is the finance and investment sector in exploration geology? And are there lots of roles in this? Um, so I'll just throw that one out there, uh, we can all chip in. <laughs> I, I can jump in with that one first. Um, so investing in very early stage exploration geology stuff is, is quite a niche market. Um, usually the, that sector is a lot bigger for careers when opportunities and projects are a bit more later in their life cycle. Um, those that have got you know, good funding um, and construction. So most of the investment in exploration goes through venture capital groups and private equity groups. Um, so... I would say if you're if you're looking for a sort of investment role, then then yeah, some of the bigger companies that have got the ability to support much wider um, teams, um, because often the early stage guys they don't they don't have much cash to employ people, and it may even be even one or two people just in the company entirely. So uh, yeah, just to add to that, um, so obviously your question was was about finance itself, I would also kind of widen that question a bit to the kind of market intelligence business side of things as well. So again, with, uh, with CRU and there's some other similar companies as well. Um, there was a lot, I mean, there are a lot, there are a lot of jobs um, <laughs> right, right now. Um, obviously, as I said before in my, in, in my presentation, you know, the commodities market for the last 12 months and probably for the next six or, six or seven has been um, exciting, but to put it, uh, <laughs> to put it in, into one word, um, so much as obviously you've got the investment side is a huge thing, it's also uh, market intelligence, business intelligence feeding into that is also a huge thing. Um, and I said, you know, companies large and small. So, I mean, you know, you had Delo uh, Deloitte, you were talking about before, do parts of that. You've got companies like CRU, you've got Macquarie Group, different sizes, all coming in from a kind of slightly different angle. Um, but that's also something to consider when you're talking about the kind of finance thing because I think that often ends up being quite a broad term and actually it's quite a huge huge thing uh in, in mining so I've considered that also um, but there's definitely many opportunities in that moment I've got nothing to add on that I'll leave it to the uh finance experts thanks everyone that was really useful um so I don't know, this one might be more of a Rose question. Um, it's from Chloe. Um, what, are, what are the more geochemical based roles, positions available in exploration geology? Um, I know that's your background, but um, I'll start with you, Rose. I mean, okay, there are many, many answers to this because a lot of exploration is pinned on geochemistry. So very broad scale, exploration might use soil stream sediment sampling which is geochemistry there is also when you're at the mine site level so a company once they start drilling will send off the core samples or rock samples um to to geochem labs um adjacent to that there's the microscopy work which goes alongside it and it helps to have a geochemical background and knowledge to be able to do good petrography um modeling will rely on the geochemistry that comes out of it so there's there's a lot of geochemistry within um within exploration and in mining there is then also the kind of moving on from that when mining is taking place um metallurgists and people like that who design how to process the rock will need to have a good understanding of the chemistry 
people who look at the waste that comes from mining need to have a good understanding of the chemistry so what you know if you've got nasty metals how they react in the environment are you going to end up with acid mine drainage are you going to end up with all sorts of toxic metals in your in your tailings dam so geochemistry is incredibly important the whole way through even you know how you how you process how you go from a rock to a metal in, is like a huge chemistry set you know you might roast it you might use fancy electro winning techniques you can use leaching increasingly as as people are more environmental focused so at Leicester there's there's a big contingent that are looking at using um environmentally friendly liquids to to leach the rock so kind of like using cyanide in gold but um not environmentally damaging so <laughs> the answer i mean i could talk about this forever there is having a good geochemical knowledge if you want if you are interested in geochemistry um going into mining is, is a nice easy jump across um i don't think i realized just how broad it was when i did it i just panicked and only really knew about the exploration side um so it depends kind of what you're interested in if you enjoy the field work aspect of geology and geochemistry the you know the um the exploration side and understanding sampling would be helpful whereas if you care about sustainability and that kind of stuff looking at the waste streams might be more for you um I mean, yeah, if you enjoy lab work, then maybe the metallurgy side. Um, so I think getting experience and knowing how broad geochemistry is, is certainly where I, not failed, but I just think I didn't quite understand the scope of it. And then that leads into the kind of like the iogas and the software um, side as well. So I haven't really used iogas, but I know it's used more and more. Um, so maybe that's where you can, can kind of come in. Yeah, sure. Um, I fully agree with all of what Rosa said. Um, exploration in particular, our smaller companies like your junior explorers, they typically don't have specialist geochemists because they don't have the budget for it. So as a geologist, you would do the little bits of geochemistry that are required. Um, if you don't have the specialist in-house knowledge, you might export that or, or contract that out to a company that does. Um, but a lot of what the work you might do might involve does might involve does your rock have metals in it yes no and then any further work might be uh, contracted out the bigger companies are the ones which might have a specialist geochemistry division so Rio Tinto has principal geoscientists for example uh, and they will be across you know an entire region helping out the different projects um, so yeah th there are lots of opportunities out there in the mining space and exploration space um, but it just depends on which company you're looking at nothing to add from me on that i'll do that as one as well <laughs> great um so um i'm going to kind of skip down the questions and this one um i think is quite interesting um it says it's from james and it says um hi all are there other ways of gaining industry experience other than placements or internships maybe such as projects you can do in your own time um one answer that I would say to that is a little plug from me is to get involved um, at the Geological Society. Um, there's um, heavily discounted student membership. There's um, the Early Career Network, which um, Hugh, Alex, and I'm not sure JQ are involved, um, but it's a great opportunity to connect. Um, and also there's training courses, but I'll kind of throw the question out to all of you um, what do you recommend other than work placements um, to get involved in industry? Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, obviously, internships and work placements are, are the gold standard because you get direct insight into the industry you're interested in. But yeah, uh, training courses uh, are a very good one. There are some free courses out there um, on the likes of YouTube. Uh, you could also perhaps look at some of the, uh, the course uh, platforms like edu mine um there's there's all sorts out there and they will give you expert training in different bits of software particular uh, areas of the mining or exploration industry that you're interested in as becky mentioned involvement through the various uh, societies professional bodies out there is a fantastic way not only to upskill yourself get broader exposure to the industry as a whole but also then to network and it's the network that can often land you the job not necessarily what you know but it's who you know 
And that can't be understated in this industry. Um, 70 odd percent of jobs in our industry are through networking, particularly for the smaller companies. As I mentioned at the start, um, during my presentation, the really reason I probably got a job at Altus, the first company I worked for, is because I went to the same university. Um, and they probably like the graduates from Camden School of Mines. So those, I'd echo those sentiments. And in terms of your own projects, if you can perhaps demonstrate um, a side hustle that you're working on, um, if you do some uh, mapping on like a contract rate on a, a website, that's all good stuff that a company might turn around and look at and go, you know what, this guy's got initiative, this girl's doing a really good job over here. And that could give you that cutting edge against uh, your potential competitors. Um, yeah, I think, yeah, I think, yeah, uh, he, he summarized it quite well there. But um, I would say, yeah, more important, the most important thing for me would be the kind of, yeah, the training courses. So again, there are many free ones out there. So um, for what I do, so the more smart data analysis kind of space, um, I was talking about kind of honing in those um, Excel skills. So for example, uh, I think Udemy, for example, has a, um, financial analyst um, course you can do very extensive um, so I'm sure you know you, you can uh, uh, spend some time on that um, obviously at the end of it you get, kind of get a certificate okay that may that may not be kind of like a you know a, you know a international like, certified type thing but the skills you will gain from that will be useful and if you can demonstrate that that's that's great um, again to uh, repeat what Hugh and uh, Becky have said the Judgment Society. So, um, you said that, uh, who and I are obviously involved in that in the early career network, um, but your, your, your local regional groups as well, for example. Um, so, I'm aware of um, my, uh, my family's from the, uh, from the Midlands. I know the um, Midlands group, they do field trips uh, to uh, you know, local, local kind of geological hotspots, things like that. I'm sure the other regional groups, uh, groups do that as well. Um, you've also obviously got kind of um, talks and workshops that the Geological Society do. So I think um, it's just been posted in the, in, in the uh, group there. Have a look at that. That's definitely, I think that definitely a kind of first port of call. And then kind of areas outside of that. So we're talking about software. Um, it can be difficult, and please correct me if I'm wrong, I'm going to hear you, but it can be difficult to get um, detailed, uh, in-depth kind of workshops for free um, on those things. But, um, you know, the early career network, you know, we have put on uh, like an iGAS uh, thing, for example. So keep your eyes open, um, sign up to those kind of mailing lists. And I'm sure something will come through. Um, but apart from that, I think, you know, all you can do is kind of, yeah, take, use your initiative. If, you know, you're reading the right things, um, you know, if you see something in an article, you know, maybe kind of, oh, you know, what's going on with that? Can I contact someone, ask about that? And then also that will kind of add to the kind of networking, you know, people that, oh, I remember that person who asked me about this, that type of thing. Um, so, yeah, that's what I would say, uh, just to kind of add to what you said there. I think as well, and if, if you're still at university, reaching out to kind of master students or PhD students who are doing lab work and ask if you can see what they're doing. Um, so if you're if you're based at Campbell or Leicester or where there's like big mining groups within the department, you can probably get a feel for, you know, you could sit behind somebody on the SEM while they were looking for gold in a thin section or see what it's like for a day in the lab so get those kind of broader skills as well um just from a more um like physical perspective rather than just doing it online in a training course um or see if you can get involved in like a research group um universities have them and universities do a lot of free talks as well like seg groups um things like that or you or um museums so also from the midlands dudley had a great museum with loads of geology samples that i kind of like um I kind of did a bit of curation on and do some like um cross sections and stuff for them for various bits and pieces so it's not always big companies that you have to go to there are some more weird and wonderful ways to to get experience i would say if you can get a little bit more creative yeah, I'd echo a couple of points in there. One is is networking and meeting people and joining different uh, professional organizations and um, trying to meet people face to face is really important, particularly in the beginning of your career. Like you said, it's, it's who you know sometimes. Um, but also sort of echoing Rose's point there. Um, one of it was that when I was doing my master's, I did my thesis on um, a project which was owned by one of the mining companies in London. 
And they were very happy for me to go and basically work for them for free while doing my master's. But as a result, I didn't do any field work there. I just sat in um, sat in their office and was sitting around the, the chief executive um, um, and the chief operating officer. And so that was a great sort of bit of experience for me, um, obviously not getting paid through it, but just to be able to sit in, a, in an office with some really experienced people and learn from them. So there's opportunities um, in, in that sort of space as well. Just to finish up, um, Alex, you, you did mention that the higher end software training courses are a bit more expensive. That is absolutely true, um, but it's a very worthwhile investment, I would add. Uh, 250, 500 quid now, which could land you a job sooner, is probably a worthwhile investment. And uh, you, I think you also mentioned that someone in the chat had mentioned something about um, Alan Jones saying about conferences. You can go to conferences like One to One Investment or Minds and Money, PDAC. Uh, prospectors something something uh, associated with canada um fill in the blank google it um if you go to those that's a fantastic way of networking as well thanks everyone that's really helpful um there's more questions than we have time to answer i'm afraid there's only a couple of minutes left of this session before we move on to um the academia session um, so if the speakers have the opportunity, perhaps you could type answers um, to some of the questions in the chat and if you um, have a few minutes after the session. Um, but one question that I think um, you may have covered in some of the presentations earlier on um, is um, how much essential, how essential is it um, for to be a technical expert, i.e. software specialist, to do a job related to geology and mining, etc. What is the most important softwares to learn for a career in geology? Um, so if you could, um, all of you just quickly kind of chip in with that one, that'd be great. Sure, um, maybe I can, I can start with this. I actually did a survey of jobs over the last six months to see how often particular bits of software were cited um and yes software is desired or required in about 70 to 80 percent of all jobs exploration and mining so it's it's pretty much a necessity these days and will become increasingly more so the big one would be any sort of gis software um, because gis is used not only in this industry but across the geoscience sector um arc gis and map info are two paid ones but qgis quantum gis is absolutely free so you can download it yourself and do stuff with it in your own time. Um, and there are some courses online that you can either pay for or get some budget ones for free. Um, on the mining side, it's the 3D modeling software. Leapfrog is probably the big one. Micromine is probably second data mine as well. But if you can get any sort of training on Leapfrog, they do occasional courses up in London. Um, it's worthwhile trying to get some skills there as well. So those are the big ones, I'd say. Um, yeah, from a kind of analyst, uh, slightly, uh, slight, slight finance point of view, um, yeah, Excel, <laughs> um, as, 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 as I've said a few times now, um, yeah, that would be probably the biggest one. There are uh, dedicated uh, data management um, and analysis softwares, um, but often companies don't necessarily expect you to know those things as you go in. That's something you will do while you're there. Um, but I think certainly, I, yeah, I, I can't say it enough. Excel. <laughs> yeah, I'd say le le a lot of the stuff that I, I've picked up has been on the job um, as well. I think if, if you do manage to get an internship, usually some of those internships will have some sort of software that you can get your hands into and, and learn from some people around you. So yeah, there's different ways of trying to get that, that access to some different technical platforms and different softwares. But yeah, ultimately, like, like we've been saying, it's quite critical to to get some sort of experience on, on one of these platforms behind you. Yeah, just to finish, I, I totally agree. QGIS is amazing in it being free and increasingly smaller. So like the um, company that I do my PhD with, they use Q because it means that you can show clients or, you know, everybody can access QGIS. Whereas like with some GIS systems, it's difficult to use the full functionality with different people. Um, and the free course is like great. Um, the MicroMind course I went on, for instance, it wasn't that expensive. It was about £100. I think they do subsidise student rates. Um, and it's definitely worth doing. Um, and then yet yeah, Excel, because I, it just can't be underestimated how much that thing can do. And you can think you're an expert in it and then realise that actually you've been doing something that's taken you, you know, however long to work out how to do and actually you can do it in two seconds and set up macros so 
actually becoming really good at things like that is super important. And it amazes me how many um, undergraduates don't really know how to use Excel like when I demonstrate to them um, because its functionality is just amazing. So, yeah, I'm part of the Excel fan club. Thank you. I don't think there's any career anymore that doesn't use Excel. <laughs> I agree. It's useful everywhere. Um, thanks, guys. Um, your presentations were all brilliant and um, you tackled the questions really well. Um, the next session is going to be on academia, research and post-grad pathways. Um, I can see the panellists have joined us. Um, so we've got Paul, Louisa and Mo. Um, and I believe Paul will be kicking us off. So um, over to you, Paul. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Hi, everyone. Um, good, uh, good to see you, uh, you all here. I hope you find this useful. Uh, hi, Louisa. Hi, Mo. Good to see you both. Um, I guess, yes, I'll start with um, a brief introduction to me. Um, and I think then um, uh, I will introduce, uh, I'll get uh, Louisa and Mo to both introduce themselves uh, via some uh, little uh, presentations. So let me just share my, if you can let me know uh, if this is working or not. And that's, can you see that? Yeah, I can. Super. Okay. All right. Yeah. So just a brief introduction to me. Uh, and what I do and what my job is like. Um, so uh, this is me, um, uh, I'm Paul Savage. I'm a senior lecturer at the School of Envir Earth and Environmental Sciences at the University of St. Andrews. Um, my undergraduate degree was in geology. It was a four-year undergrad master's at the University of Bristol. I graduated in 2006. And then my postgraduate degree was a DPhil at Oxford. And I, I finished that DPhil in 2011. Um, what do I do? So I'm a senior lecturer, um, so I was just promoted last year, I think, or this year, maybe, no, this year. Um, before that, I was a lecturer. Uh, I'm sure, you know, uh, you all know what a lecturer does. But just to recap, um, my, um, my role is generally split up into, um, into three areas, uh, and it's nominally 40% research, 40% teaching, and then 20% service. Service is admin. Um, helping to run the school, helping to in, be involved in, um, in various uh, resp roles, responsibility roles within the university and in, in the school as well. Um, uh, what do I like mostly about mo most about my job? Um, I get to do my own research, which is great. You know, I carry on. I'm, I'm still fascinated in how the earth works, what it's made from. One great thing about working in academia is that it's extremely flexible. Uh, in many ways, you're your own boss. Um, you're very you're mainly, mainly responsible for your own, own work. Um, I get to teach. I really enjoy teaching. I really especially like teaching the field. This image on the side here is just me uh, in Aaron. This is one of the first field trips you managed to get to um, back after the pandemic shut everything down. So this was really nice. Even if the weather does look a bit grey, it was great to get back in the field. Um, I, the people I work with are great as well, so that's great. But one of the main things is that no two days are alike in academia. It's a really varied job, so um, it's really difficult to get bored <laughs> in academia. So uh, it's uh, th things are all you know things move around. Um, think yeah, lot, there's lots going on. Um, what do I do in research? Well, my research mostly focuses on the ancient Earth, uh, what it's made from. Um, why did it evolve like it did? How did we go from uh, a cloud of dust and gas to the differentiated and habitable planet, habitable planet upon which we live today? And to do this, I, I'm mainly a geochemist. So I look at the composition of ancient rocks. So this is just me on the island of South Uist with some uh, Lewisian gneisses. These are some of the oldest rocks in Europe. Uh, and I also use um, the analyses of meteorites. So this is the Palisite meteorite here. In fact, I don't, I don't actually analyze palisites, but I'll just put this up here because it's beautiful. Um, I mostly analyze primitive meteorites, which don't look as, quite as beautiful. Uh, with teaching, I, in fact, I, a lot of what I'm in my research that informs um, what I teach. So I teach a lot of geochemistry and I study geochemistry um, uh, throughout all um, years. So I teach from first year up to master's level. Um, uh, I really, really enjoy teaching. Uh, I, th I think it's a really rewarding part of my job. And um, part of it as well is I get the opportunity to teach field classes as well. So St. Andrews, the university I work at, they um, pride themselves on having quite a number of days in the field. 
Uh, and one of the, I'm lucky enough to be part of the Alps field trip where we spent two weeks transecting the Alps and, and showing um, undergraduate students how beautiful rocks are in the field as they are at you and, and what they can tell us about how mountains form. Um, and finally, I guess I just thought I'd sort of sum up in terms of how did I get to where I was today uh, as a lecturer. So I started life, I grew up in the northeast of England in a small town called Hartlepool. Um, not many people, uh, well, when I was, you know, quite a few, it's, uh, it's, it's not that common for people to go to, well, it wasn't that common for people to go to university back then. Uh, it's more common now, but um, uh, uh, I went to University of Bristol to study geology. Um, and then I didn't really know what I wanted to do. So I took a job working, first of all, for Thatcher Cider in the cider factory. And then uh, that was a summer job. And I ended up working in a chemistry lab of a place that made fake nails. So that was another, that was another bit of interesting uh, job that I was part of. Um, and then in the end, I thought, well, I did, really did miss working um, in, uh, in academia. I missed, I missed research. So then I applied and successfully got a place on a position at Oxford to do a PhD, uh, or as they call it, Oxford to DPhil. Uh, and then I spent four years doing a DPhil there. And after that, I became a postdoc. Uh, and a postdoc is really uh, where you sort of, so you, often you think of a PhD as, that's how you, you're sort of basically getting a, um, a qualification to do research, really. And then postdocs are where you kind of, prove to people that you can do research on your own, really. And that's how you get your sort of feet under the table, as it were, in, in academia. And so I moved to the States. Um, I worked in the States for two and a half, three years in St. Louis, um, at, the, at Washington University in St. Louis. Um, then I moved to Paris for a year, um, and I got a fellowship while I was in St. Louis, but I got a fellowship that took me to Paris, and then finally to Durham. Uh, and then after that, I got my... Um, I got my uh, first lectureship in 2016 at the University of St Andrews, and I've been here um, ever since. Um, I realised that was a bit of a whistle stop too. That's my um, Twitter handle down there. If anyone wants to follow me, I mean, I mostly talk about sport, so I'm not sure if it's most. <laughs> I'm not sure if it's that useful for the careers, but uh, I do do sometimes talk about science. Um, but uh, I guess that's um, that's what I've got in terms of my presentation. Um, I guess what I'll do next is I'll stop sharing and ask um, Louisa to um, give her presentation and to introduce herself. So over to you. Great. Right, um, just checking, Becky, is it? Um, are, are we sharing it ourselves? Or <laughs> because I wasn't told when we were. Going. Yeah. Um, if you could share it yourselves, <laughs> I can share I, it. If you've got bad internet though. Yeah. If you could do, just because my internet's a bit bad today. Thank One you. Moment. Um, would you like to kind of give a verbal introduction whilst? I'm yeah. Yeah. Well? Yeah. But yeah. Hi everyone. <laughs> Sorry for the technical difficulties. Um, my name is Louisa Brotherson. I'm PhD researcher at the University of Liverpool. Um, coming towards my third year, so almost a fourth and final year. And um, yeah, I guess my um, background is more in geophysics. So um, my research is to do with earthquakes and I use um, analog experiments to better understand earthquake source properties. Um, yeah, I'll, I think my slides have a lot more detail than that brief introduction. All right, one moment. Um, I'm just sharing the screen of your presentation. All right, um, one second. Yeah, I can see it. Thanks so much. Great, thank you. Oh yeah, I've already said that. So yeah, that's fun. So yeah, I'm a third year PhD researcher and, and that's that's me. Yeah, hopefully I should finish uh, sometime next year. Thanks. Uh, so my current role, um, I'm, I research full time. So um, I'm 50% lab based and 50% computer based. So that's a picture of me doing some experiments in the rock deformation lab, uh, which is in the basement, <laughs> but it's a really cool lab. We do all kinds of experiments. So lots of squashing rocks, lots of um, deformation, high temperature, um, high pressure um, experiments. Uh, my experiments uh, involve creating lab generated earthquakes. So things uh, such as Think things like stick slips and acoustic emissions, which are really tiny um, kind of um, 
equivalent to earthquakes. So you can't like feel them. You can only hear them. They make like a little popping noise, the stick slips, and you can't even hear the acoustic emissions. Um, but what I'm trying to do is to reduce the, the uncertainty in earthquake source properties. So things uh, like, um, so the earthquake source is basically the area of a fault which slips during an earthquake. And because we don't have a massive drill or we can't really dig to the center of an earthquake when it sort of starts. So we don't know uh, the exact properties of, of what's actually happening right at the fault. So I aim to recreate that by making really small ones. Um, I really enjoy um, being flexible and in independent in my own research. Um, I think uh, like Paul was saying, being a PhD is really getting your training in and just getting used to being a researcher and trying new things and getting things wrong lots of the time. And <laughs> you have the freedom and flexibility just to do that and choose what you um, like, depending on what you enjoy. Um, next slide, please. Thanks. Cool. My current project. So um, I'm currently doing some work to um, kind of link my work to induced seismicity, so um, hydraulic fracturing, such as that. Um, so I've just completed a training course on that topic of induced seismicity. I've also done all kinds of other training with my PhD, so things like um, outdoor first aid, Python, academic writing, um, like thesis writing and things. I've also been a postgraduate outreach representative. So um, I used to run geoscience outreach events at the Victoria Gallery and Museum for kids. So we did a spooky science um, event a couple of years ago where we got all kinds of um, uh, different fossils and things like shark's teeth and all kinds of things were getting kids involved in geology. And Presently, I'm part of the African Caribbean Research Collective, which um, stemmed from the lack of diversity in STEM. So it's a support group for um, Black Caribbean PhD students after finding out in a report that there were only 30 of us that were UKRF, UKRI funded in the UK. We were like, what? So we all got together and have formed a collective now, which is really cool. Um, next slide, please. And yeah, this is just my journey, I guess, to my PhD. I guess just before that um, first dot, um, I grew up in Birmingham. Um, I was always interested in um, kind of geography and understanding planet Earth and also problem solving and maths. Um, so I ended up doing my MGeophys, so integrated masters in geophysics at the University of Leeds, which I finished in 2018. Um, my third year, I did a year abroad at Western University in Canada, so that's two hours southwest of Toronto. And there I did all kinds of cool courses that I wouldn't have done in the UK. So things like quaternary geology to do with glacier, gl glaciology and stuff to do with um, earthquake seismology that I hadn't done in the UK, so that was really cool. Um, I also did a short internship doing research in Germany, paid for by the DIAD. Um, and that was great to get some research experience. And then I applied for my PhD in my fourth year and I got that at the University of Liverpool where I am now. So thanks. And thanks Becky for sharing your screen. Great, thanks Louisa, uh, that's fantastic. I think, well, and finally let's move on to uh, Mohammed or Mo. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, after you take it away, do you, do you, have you got your slides? Yeah, great. All right. Just trying to share my screen here. Yeah. Hi, Paul. Hi, Louisa. Hey. Hi, Becky. Uh, yeah, first of all, I would like to thank the GSL actually for inviting me for this uh, panel. Uh, and thank you, uh, Becky, for, for all the hard work actually in, back, in, the, in, in the background. Uh, yeah, so I'm Mohamed Guiza. I'm a research fellow at the University of Leeds. I did my PhD at the University of uh, the Frey University of Amsterdam in Netherlands, and I uh, graduated in 2011. Uh, this is me here, actually, in the field, trying to uh, to, uh, to show people actually what I see. Sometimes it works. Sometimes actually I fail to do that. So, uh, but yeah, a lot of uh, my work actually uh, involves field work, but not only field work. I do also other uh techniques actually that i use in my research but let's first actually like look at what a research fellow so it's not a student and it's not a lecturer so it's somewhere actually between those two and like paul mentioned actually it's similar to a postdoc position 
where actually you try to prove actually that you can lead your own research actually and be innovative in, in your work. And that process actually involved a lot of grant writing, trying to secure funds actually to do your own research. Uh, then actually once you get those grants, you need to do the research as well and publish and disseminate your work actually in conferences and in papers as well. So uh, yeah, just a few sketches here to illustrate what I'm talking about. So some of the research that I do actually involve uh, computational methods. So uh, first of all, my, my research focus on the geodynamic of Earth. So I'm a social geologist and I do a lot of tectonics and geodynamics, basically trying to understand the evolution of, of rifts at the margins. And those are basically uh, divergent uh, plates uh, where you have the oceans, where your oceans actually form. So like I mentioned, so some of my work actually relies on numerical modeling to try to understand the processes that drive that extension and that stretching of the lithosphere. So basically your crust and your mantle as well. Uh, some of it involved, like I said, field work and, and, and some of the techniques that I use are, uh, for example, low temperature thermochronology, where you go to the field, you get samples, you uh, crash those samples, you separate your minerals and you try to find apatite and zircons and then you use those micro uh, scale uh, uh, zircon and apatite actually to, uh, to, uh, to try to get actually the inform informations about the evolution of, 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 the, of, of, uh, of the earth's surface. So, which is quite exciting actually. And I, I really like this, this integration of, of different methods like numerical modeling, field work, uh, lab work actually, and try to come up with the story actually that try to fit all those observations at the same, at the same time. So as a research fellow, usually you focus on research, but in my case, I enjoy teaching and depending on where you are and which university you, you are actually based in, you can actually sometimes have a chance actually to be involved in the teaching as well. And that's something that I enjoy a lot and I've been doing actually quite a lot here in, 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 in Leeds. And some of the modules that I teach, obviously geodynamics because that's, that's, that's my core uh, discipline, but also field work as well. So, yeah, the things that I like best about being a research fellow or being in academia is, is, is all those things that I mentioned above, most of them. Like uh, grant writing sometimes actually is, 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 is time consuming and it can be actually frustrating. But once you secure the grant actually, like you can enjoy the, the, the research and the publishing aspects and the conferences and also like try to, to, to integrate your, your research actually into the teaching, which is always interesting and stimulating for the, for the students. The flexibility is something that was mentioned by Paul and Louise, and we can all agree actually that in academia, that flexibility is something that you can really find in other uh, professional settings. Uh, so the flexibility and, and the independence actually to, uh, to design your own uh, research, but also to plan your day. I mean, like some people start working early at six in the morning and they finish early as well. Some people start late and finish late. So that flexibility is, is, is quite interesting actually in, in, in academia. And obviously the people, I mean, you meet a lot of interesting people in, 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 in wherever you go, in, 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 in your own institution, but also when you go to conferences or uh, to, to workshops and, and yeah, those colleagues actually usually become friends and long-term friends. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, so I have several, I'm working currently on several research projects. I didn't want actually to discuss my research here because I think I might be, uh, it might be a little bit boring for you. So the thing that I will, want to highlight is, is like the non-research aspect of, 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 of the work that you can get involved into when actually you are a research fellow or working in academia. And this is an example here, which actually we're trying to actually to, 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 be, to be active in our community and the structural geologists and, and tectonics community by actually uh, proposing alternatives to publishing models. The, there is some, some issue with the publishing model that we have currently because it's most of the, the publishing journals actually are for profit and that creates some, some, some issues because you need to pay actually to publish and you need to pay to read and access those, those publications. And here actually we're, we're since, since a year actually we've been working on, on malnutrition alternative, which is basically a diamond uh, open access journal. And by diamond, we mean it's a journal that's free to publish and free to access. And we're hoping actually that this journal will launch sometime in, in, in 22, early uh, 2022. 
So you can actually like do research, but you also can be actually an active member of your community and try to tackle some of those issues that the community actually uh, face. How did I get here? So uh, yeah, it was a long journey actually. So I was born and raised in Morocco and that's where I did my undergrads. Then I went to France to Strasbourg to do my masters. Then after that, I went to the Netherlands where I did my PhD at the Fry University of Amsterdam. After that, I went to Canada where I spent four years between St. John's, which is on, on, in Newfoundland on the East Coast. And then I, I, I went and spent two years in, in, in Saskatoon, in Saskatchewan, which is in, in, in central Canada. And that was really interesting uh, move because I, 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 I worked mostly on, on uranium deposits. So it was something actually that was completely new for me because I've been always working actually on the geodynamics of, 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 of first margins. But I wanted actually to see what happened actually in other fields. And I had the chance actually to integrate quite interesting projects on uranium, which was actually like, which was really nice experience and it allowed me actually to broaden my, my expertise as well. But after Canada, I, that's when I came to the UK. That was in 2015, by the end of 2015. And when I saw this fellowship here, and I went back actually from mining back to my initial field, which is geodynamics. And yeah, you can see below actually my email address, my Twitter. Uh, yeah, I do tweets mostly on, on about geology and research. So it's a very professional tweet account that I have. And you have also my LinkedIn if you want actually to, uh, to keep updated on, on my professional uh, stuff. Yeah, thank you. Your mic, Paul. Yeah, you're yeah, really beautiful. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, to to with us. Uh, uh, Becky, do you want me to deal with um, uh, uh, questions that are coming in with the chat now, or should um, we move on to the more general questions? What's your advice? Uh, yeah, if you could just yeah, jump in with the questions um, as you see fit, um, and then I'll kind of wrap up towards the end. Okay, great. Well, sorry, sorry. Thanks, Mohammed. That's what I was. That's what I was saying while I was muted. Anyway, so thanks very much. <laughs> um, so I guess uh, why don't we deal with the first question here? Which um, and maybe first, uh, Louisa, you could maybe um, do uh, first take this on. Um, and first of all, it said, "What well, what are the first steps to take before applying for a PhD?" That's one of the questions in from the chat. Yeah, that's a great question. I think the most important thing about applying for PhDs is making sure that you're gonna have a project that you're passionate about. So have a good think about on your course, what interests you and also who would be in your area in terms of supervisors. So um, whether that's at your university, whether it's abroad or it's in the same country, have a think about if you're working on something on your, on your like dissertation or uh, for your course if you're reading papers you you like those papers see who's who are the authors of them um because i applied for phds not well i went to the university of leeds but i didn't apply to any of the phds there um I, because i found people like authors who i was interested in and they they just happened to be based elsewhere so make sure it's something that you're passionate about because you're going to be spending at least three and a half, four years working on it, if not, you know, the rest of your career. <laughs> so just make sure of that. And also, um, I think, have a look at funding as well. So um, try and get a project that's funded. I know lots of projects um, can be kind of part-time where you do something called like a graduate teaching assistant. So it means that you work part-time helping to teach undergraduates and also um, do your PhD part-time. So that's also an option or universities fund it, charities sometimes fund it as well. So just have a look at funding. I know a few people, a very small number are self-funded, but try and get funding if you can, because it just alleviates a lot of the stress. Um, and yeah, just, yeah, think, think about your strengths and try and showcase your research experience, whether that be dissertation, you've done an internship, um, even, you know, I did project management because I did this charity thing with my university, something like that. So try and showcase your skills. I, yeah, totally agree with that. I, th I think what I would add from being this side of the table um, in terms of in interviewing potential PhD candidates or, or um, interacting with them is that what, what we like as PhD supervisors is when you get in touch with us. 
it's really great to hear from you as interested students um, to get you in, to see that you're engaged already and that you're, that you're reaching out. So please don't be afraid of emailing people who you'd like to work with as PhD students. Um, it's really important as well as finding a, a, a topic you like to have a really a good supervisor that you get on with. Um, and supervisors are all very different. Um, just, just as all these as students, you have very different personalities. So with your supervisors, and so it's uh, it's it's very it's it's very important, I think, to find a supervisor that you can gel with, that you get on with, and that you find that you find works well with you and your your learning style as well. And and the way to do that is to just get in touch with people. And and if you find that you're not getting on with them, well, that's that. I think that's a bit of a red flag. You know, you don't want to force that, and and it, and you think, well, maybe I can get get I can get past it. Honestly, it's it's some of the biggest difficulties of the PhD students, I think, is is not getting on with their supervisors. So so I really would uh, encourage you to get get in touch, chat with them uh, informally um, and, and see if you get on. <laughs> and, uh, and that's and, and, and if you don't. And, and now what I was what I would also say is that use the people at university as well. Use the people and use your the faculty and, and teaching fellows and research fellows and everyone who you're working with at the moment at your current universities. They, they are a really great resource. If you if there's no one at the university that you um, that, that you think you'd like to work with, just ask someone and they will, I'm sure, have lists of people who they will be able to recommend that you want to speak to. And it's, you know, and, and they will also know things that won't be advertised. You know, they, they will know people who, um, uh, you know, they'll know, they'll probably think, they'll think about you. And if they know you well, they think, oh, I think this person will work really well with this certain person. And, um, and so, um, again, I, I would sort of de definitely ask around, talk to people, talk to people informally um, and, and, and PhD super, potential PhD supervisors really are, are really happy to, to speak to potential students. They're really, normally they're flattered that students want to work with them. And so it's, uh, it's, it's, um, it's, you know, it's, uh, and so they're, um, uh, certainly I am, if people email me. <laughs> um, yeah, so, so that's what I would say when you're running up to doing a PhD, definitely um, definitely email, get in touch with people. And Mo, do you have any uh, advice? Yeah, no, I mean, I think I think you did cover actually uh, all grounds. I think I think being pro proactive and, and networking actually is is key in, in, in finding the suitable project and also finding, like Paul mentioned, suitable supervisor as well. So don't be actually shy uh, when you're doing your masters, approach your lecturers, approach like even the, the you have a lot of uh, PhD students that do demo in during uh, the practicals. And so talk to those people because they are the ones actually that can give you like a lot of uh, feedback on, on, on the process and can also guide you actually to find the, 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 the suitable uh, projects and, and, and people to work with. Great. Yeah, thanks. Um, are there any more? I don't know if there are any uh, directed questions. So maybe I'll just ask one of the questions, one of the more uh, broad questions that we are. Um, uh, and I think maybe let's talk about or talk about um, the question about what key things are expected of you um, as working in academia. Um, so, for example, does it involve field work or travel? How much desk time? What does a typical day look like for you? And I think I already mentioned that there is no really such thing as a typical day. But um, but let's go to um, Mo. Why didn't you start? What 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 what's, what would what have you done this week, for instance, so far? You know, what would you sort of do as a as an academic? Yeah. Okay. So yeah. So uh, well, I mean, like last week, I I was in the field because I'm I'm I'm, I'm involved in supervising a PhD student who is actually was in the field and she's still in the field. She'll be back uh, Monday. So I went actually and spent the first week of the field trip with her actually just to guide her actually and set her up. So, uh, so yeah, so that was last week getting back actually like you, you need to, uh, to go check your emails, reply actually to, uh, to the people that have been trying to get in touch and, and yeah, and work actually on your own research as well. So like I said, I'm, I do a lot of modeling and some of the things that I had to do after actually getting back from the field is actually go and check on my models because they run over like certain period of time. Usually they take two or three days. So you need actually to, to check the results and, and look at the, 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 the output from the model actually and try to do the analysis. I had also a few meetings with colleagues trying actually to set up uh, other projects that we're planning for the future. 
uh, I had actually like this morning I had uh, I was on on uh, an MC uh, uh, Viva so uh, for two students that were actually the, presenting their their MC project this morning so I was there actually like yeah seeing the the the, the presentation asking questions and also like uh, evaluating the, the, the presentations Uh, so how about you, Louisa? Thank you, man. So I'm just trying to think. So I, ha I have done things this week. <laughs> so um, yeah, I guess most of my time is spent um, in the lab. So um, my project is very lab based. So I'm in the lab kind of making up samples and doing frictional experiments. So um, we've got these massive like tracks or machines that you put the samples in and then you just like kind of seal it all up and put it to um, higher pressures and slide them. So I did those, I've done at least one per day this week, apart from today. Um, also I help out with um, demonstrating. So that's helping um, to teach undergraduates. So um, I was in a, an ocean atmosphere module <laughs> helping with their maths. So you can teach all kinds of things and they need people uh, for all kinds of subjects. And yeah, having like lab meetings. So we have a, a weekly meeting with our lab group and this week someone was presenting their field work. Um, but yeah, no two days are exactly the same. I, I might be doing experiments every day, but there'll be different experiments and they'll have different results. And yeah, I'll be analysing them as well. So I guess that was my week. Yeah, I mean, I, again, I, I was, I get think, um, I would say that my uh, my week, I mean, again, we're, we're in the middle of teaching in, Scot in Scottish University at the moment. So there's a lot of teaching going on at the moment. So it's um, planning lectures, doing lectures, running practical courses, doing assessments, uh, speaking to students if they want extra help. Um, before that, doing a lot of field work. So that's this time of year, very teaching heavy. And sometimes, uh, you know, outside of term time, that's when I get to do my own research or support um, my students uh, in their research more. I mean, I'm always doing that, but uh, so I'm getting more time to help those, those people out in that, in that situation. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I don't wanna, again, I think, I think the, I think the key thing is that it's a really varied lifestyle. Um, it's a really varied career choice. And, um, and, and, as, and, and I think, yeah, if you're gonna remember one thing is that no two days are the same. Um, I think there's some Q and A questions coming through now. So I think maybe I'll um, just try and deal with those. Um, okay. Uh, from Isaac Watkins, hi all. Until listening to the academia research course, I've only considered a role within the Minex industry or the applied GIS industry. I was wondering how the research grant funding works. Do you find the research and can the research find you? Um, it's, that's a great question. Research funding um, for PhDs um, is, 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 depending on which country you, you want to work in, it, it is very variable. So in the UK, um, PhD students are not classed as um, employees, as it, and mostly they are still students, which means that you don't pay tax, which is good. So you get a stipend rather than a, um, a wage. Um, mostly um, geoscience PhDs are funded through um, NERC, or sorry, research councils, UKRI research councils. A lot of them are funded through NERC, some through STFC and some other um, smaller uh, funding bodies. Um, and most, and often they are associated with what are called doctoral training programs, um, which you apply for. So you apply directly to a university or a group of universities. Um, you go through a sort of interview process, and then you um, are, are there asked, and then hopefully you are successful in receiving um, uh, the funding that is associated with a number of so most universities will get a certain number of funded studentships every year. And so you apply through, a comp you, you go through a competition to, to hopefully become one of those top 10, 15 students, how many studentships the, um, the, uh, the university or group of universities got, got, um, got provided with by UKRI. Um, so that's the traditional route is applying and applications uh, it'll probably start around this time of year, actually. So, so uh, most most application um, cycles for PhD for DTP projects will start now. The interviews will be um, January, February time, going through into March, and then by March time, I think most people you'll you'll start to hear whether or not you've um, received an offer. 
Um, but they can go on a bit longer. There's often a bit of a bun fight because you know some students will be get two or three offers and they'll choose one. So there'll be a bit of a there'll be you know the, the you know you 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 might be on reserve lists. So there'll be reserve lists and there'll be lots of arguing between in the background about who gets PhDs and things like that. So. Um, uh, but um, but yes, uh, that, that's kind of the traditional way in the UK. Um, although there, but there are, I would say, also non-traditional routes to getting PhDs in the UK. Um, which again, some funding, uh, some projects that uh, very uh, specific academics have funded will have um, PhD funded PhDs as part of the um, as part of the research project. So there, there will be some some. Um, research grants that a PI has gained that, that has a PhD project associated with it. And those will not be advertised often on the same time scale as um, uh, the, the kind of standard DTP um, uh, studentships that are advertised. So again, this is why it's really important to email um, the supervisors that you, you're interested in working with, because each supervisor, each university might have a, a, a separate set of schemes as well. So universities often have internally funded PhDs as well. So and 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 so that there's a myriad ways of getting funded for, to do a PhD study, um, and uh, it, it's it's impossible to list them all in a 45 minutes. Uh, so so that, that's why it's it's also really really important to get in touch directly with the people you want to work with because they'll be the best people to know who. who um, where the money comes from, basically. Um, does anyone else have anything to add on that? Yeah, maybe just like quickly, I would like to because yeah, the, what you mentioned is essentially actually like the best way actually like to find the uh, PhD project is is through those uh, pre-funded uh, grants or uh, that actually like PIs put together. But sometimes, just like based on my own, like just maybe telling my own experience with with PhD actually is a little bit because. Like the question was, do you find the PhD or does the PhD find you? And in my case, maybe actually like the PhD, it's the PhD that found me because when I was doing my master's, uh, I, I talked with my uh, master thesis supervisor and told him that I want to do a PhD on this uh, theme. And he didn't have at the time, he didn't have anything actually available, but like he sent emails around and 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 like a couple of months later, I got an email from the uh, professor at the University of Amsterdam, actually, basically telling me that he got my my CV through my uh, MSc supervisor, actually, and he has a project that fits with the 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 theme that I wanted to work on. And if I was interested, actually, I should contact him and 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 discuss the project with him. So that 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 that. The being proactive actually and approaching people and networking actually does pay off actually in 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 in, in a lot of cases. So uh, so that's another way actually of of of, of finding actually PhD projects if you want to go that route. Yeah, I, I completely agree. Yeah, it, it, sometimes the research does find you. Um, it's uh, Louisa. Do you have anything to add about? Uh... Um, I guess find the PhD dot com. <laughs> so that's my initial answer. It has a lot of PhDs on there. Um, and it's like a database so but they're not just all on there I'd also say go on Twitter get a Twitter account because lots of people tweet uh, academic Twitter is a big thing so lots of people will advertise on there as well thanks Louisa and I'll just run through the next quickly does St Andrews run a geochemistry master's course yes it does I used to coordinate it it's still going it's a brilliant course please apply I'll put a link into the chat Next question <laughs> is, uh, I, <laughs> someone, I didn't pay, did someone turn up to, <laughs> I didn't, honestly didn't pay someone to do that. Uh, question by, from Cameron Sanderson. I hear a lot of people talk about minimizing fieldwork, but I actually dream of a career where fieldwork is maximized. How much fieldwork is involved typically in a PhD postdoc career path? Any tips, ideas for the types of paths that allow for a lot of time out in the field? Um, I guess, I'll quickly sit my, I'll quickly give my answer to this, is that it's kind of, it really depends on the PhD and research you choose to do. Some uh, PhDs are almost all focused in the field um, and, um, uh, and and some are completely lab-based. I mean, my, my um, PhD is, was all done in a chemistry clean lab, really, although I did manage to get into the field here and there to collect some samples. It was mostly geochemistry-based. But um, it's really, um, again, if you have a, 
uh, if you want to go into a very fieldwork focused PhD, then um, the, just ask, um, in, uh, you need, first of all, obviously have a, an idea about the kind of research focus, but there will always be, a, almost certainly be a fieldwork PhD that will suit your um, research uh, likes. Um, uh, would anyone else like to come into that? Um, yeah, I'm not. I'm not really field based, uh, so so um, I was going to say, Mo, if you want to go ahead. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I do. I do a lot of field field work. I mean, I can see where 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 the questions come from about minimizing field work. I don't think it's. I, in my opinion, actually, like we can't we can't avoid field work in earth sciences, but we need to be aware that like it's not not all uh, geosciences actually need require field work. You can actually like do actually like an amazing career in geoscience without having actually to, to, to go to the field. And that comes actually to your own uh, preferences and your own choice and the type of career actually that you want you want to have. And I, I, I can I can say that, yeah, I mean, like it's like we like Paul said is it's it's up to you actually when you choose your your PhD project that you want actually to apply for. Be careful, actually, like and 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 you need to, to 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 make sure actually that it include the, the those skills and those uh, uh, themes actually that you you enjoy the most. So if you like to do field work, then actually you can you need to look for PIs and and and, and projects that do involve field works. And and like I said, I mean I don't think we can we can we can go we can we can uh, we can uh, avoid field work in, in earth sciences. But at the same time, you can do actually career injury science without having to do it to, to do field work. So it's it's really up up to your uh, to you. Completely agree. Yes. Um, uh, I think we should uh, next question, Jennifer. Employability wise, is there a better option, MSc or MSci? I assume this is um, a separate masters versus an integrated masters question. Um, I would say that, um, I mean, I, I didn't do a separate master's. I got, but again, I got my PhD a decade ago. So um, uh, I would say that um, it sort of depends on really, and it's a bit, bit of a bottom line question here. If you've got a very strong integrated master's, then you've, you've probably got a good chance of, in terms of your final mark, um, and, and especially regarding how you performed in your research dissertation in your integrated master's, then that will, hold you in, uh, that would be good for getting a, a PhD. Um, I know a lot of people use uh, an MSc as a stepping stone. So a separate, a, a, a separate master's MSc as a stepping stone to go into PhD uh, research. So I would say that um, uh, um, uh, it's, uh, it, it, it sort of depends on um, really the quality of your first degree, I think, in terms of how, how well you did. I think a lot of people are doing a, a separate masters now, um, but um, I would say um, an integrated masters for me wasn't a barrier to getting a PhD. But um, I'm not sure about uh, the other two um, uh, panelists. Yeah, so for me, um, I did an MSc. Um, no, sorry, not MSc. MSci. It's because it's because it's called it M Geophys at Liverpool, so and Leeds, so it's confused me. Um, but anyway, um, and my, I did that in 2018. I think before applying for PhDs, um, lots of people used to say to me, "Oh, you need a, like an MSc, like you need a full-on masters to even be considered to do a PhD." And I would definitely say, even now, um, that like uh, not having an MSc isn't a barrier to getting a PhD. Um, the most important thing is to showcase where you've had research experience in your undergraduate degree. So whether that be, you've done like a, like a, you know, like you get paid like summer research sort of position sometimes. So you can do that or um, in your dissertation and your um, and integrated master's thesis and in your reports and things. So it definitely isn't a barrier, but um, you know, if you if you're applying for PhDs with an M MSI and you're not getting anywhere, then maybe it's something to consider. Um, but also, yeah, talk to your course coordinators and people because they'll have an idea. Depending on what area you're, you're going into, whether an MSC is more expected or not. Mo, would you have you got anything to add to that? Okay, so I guess that let's. I think we've got one more minute or so to to answer a final question. Uh, which is a really good question. 
Um, hi, I'm struggling to make my mind up whether I want to do a PhD or not, as I keep hearing very conflicting views. Do you have any advice in terms of making the decision? Um, for me, quickly, um, I didn't know either, which is why I didn't go straight into applying for PhDs. I took a year off. I worked, as I said, for a cider farm, a cider factory making cider. I worked um, as a chemist in labs in various uh, companies. Um, and that time off, that one year off, really helped me made my, make my decision, made my mind up, because I really missed it. Often when you're in university, when you're in the thick of doing your undergraduate dissertation, everything is really overwhelming and you might be, you might be a little bit burnt out. But it's good, and it's good to take a bit of distance. So if you can afford it, and, it, and again, it, it, um, it doesn't stop you from being um, employable as a PhD student, taking a year out to, to, um, to, to explore your options. If you want, you know, my advice is, is sort of try and have some distance between um, you and, and, the, and, the, uh, and, 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 and the potential career. And that really helps you make your mind up. I mean, it helped, it helped me make my mind up. And um, that was that, well, that's just my personal experience. So um, I, I guess with Louisa and Mo, do you have any advice in that, in that respect, how to make your mind up about doing a PhD? Yeah, I mean, maybe in my case, it was a little bit different because I knew actually from the beginning, actually, when I went to university that I wanted actually to do a, a PhD. So, so that was something that, yeah, I mean, but yeah, it's, 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 I think it, it's, it's quite a difficult decision to be honest, because it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's like you, you commit to a three, four years actually uh, doing research. So you need to be sure that it's something that you want to do. And essentially you need to make sure actually to find the right project for, 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 for you. Because sometimes actually like you can, I mean, like I think a lot of people, I mean, most people have the abilities actually to do a PhD project. The question is that, is, is the project suitable for, for, for you or not? And that's, that's something that you need actually to, uh, to, to, to be careful and spend, take the time actually to think about it and, 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 and then decide. And I always say actually that you need, if you want to cross a river, you need to get your feet wet. So, uh, so yeah, it's one of those things you need actually to go into it to, 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 to find out actually if you really like it or not. Yeah, and for, finally, Louisa, anything to add? Yeah, I, I think just like, yeah, just give it a go. Like, <laughs> have a, like whether you can have like a little taste of research experience beforehand, but lots of it is like, I think, it's, it's lots of like finding yourself and finding out what you don't like is quite important. So it's, I think finding the PhD for you can be quite difficult, but understanding things that you don't like can help eliminate sort of PhDs that you definitely won't like. So just try and do that because everyone can like kind of tolerate some things that they don't like, but anything that's just like a red, red flag and just, because <laughs> yeah, there's not much you can do. Like there'll be elements of work, every job that you don't like. So just trying things that, Try things that you uh, try things, and if you don't like it, then you know. <laughs> that's good. fantastic. Yeah, I, I would say I would say that's a great great thing for, thing to end on is definitely mm. just give it a go. Um, yeah. uh, it, there's there's plenty. Of, uh, if you work at university, there's there's almost certainly um, labs that will have you as summer students or as uh, temporary research for, um, uh, technicians and things like that. And and, and staff are really happy to give uh, students research experience. So if that's if that's one way of uh, of trying it out, definitely go for that. I would totally agree. Give it a go, and then then you get a test for it, or maybe you don't, but then you'll know. Um, I think that's all time we've got. Becky, is that right? Yeah, it is. Um, I'm sorry to cut you off when um, we could carry on talking about this for at least another hour. Um, there's just so much to cover, um, but. Um, I'd like to kind of lead into the next session. Um, it's on publishing um, in geosciences, which is obviously both critical in um, academia and industry. And um, my colleagues from the publishing house um, at the society have put together a presentation. Um, I'll be playing that in the next minute, and then I'll hand over to my colleagues, Bethan and David, who are here to answer any questions you may have. So please submit those in the Q&A box. All right, so I'll just share my screen. One moment. Um, can you give me the thumbs up, Bethan or David, if you can hear this? Welcome to the Publishing in the Geosciences talk. 
My name's Helen Floyd Walker. I'm a journal manager at the Geological Society Publishing House. Hi, I'm Trisha Pantos, and I'm also a journal manager at the Geological Society. So today we are going to talk about uh, the various aspects of publishing. I'm going to discuss a little bit about uh, GSL publications and then uh, the majority of this talk is going to be kind of the author experience. So how to choose a journal, how the peer review process works, and then uh, some publishing and promotion uh, discussion. Uh, at the end, since this is a careers talk, we'll talk a little bit about uh, careers and opportunities in publishing. So first, uh, these are the publications that the Geological Society um, publishes. We have six hybrid journals. Uh, and when I say hybrid, this means we can publish under a regular license or under an open access license. And recently for 2021, we've launched a new fully open access journal, Earth Science System and Society. And we've recently published uh, the first few papers for this journal. In addition to that, we have a number of book series and there are a number of other publications that we partner with. So uh, just to go over the author, uh, sorry, the uh, publication process. Uh, so in academic publishing, uh, I think most of you are probably familiar with this, but just to kind of go over the basics, anyone can be involved in academic publishing. So anyone doing research. So that can be someone in academia, in government, or in, in a government industry research. So um, the roles involved can be you can participate as an author, as a reviewer, or as an editor. So from our perspective at the Geological Society, uh, the content that we publish, uh, a number of it is invited. So our special publication book series uh, is entirely invited content. So we'll have some editors who then invite a number of authors under a particular topic or theme who submit and then publish in a special publication. Uh, similarly, for journals, we can have invited uh, authors for reviews or thematic collections. So while we do have a significant amount of invited content, the majority of our journal content is unsolicited uh, submissions. So this is people doing research and then deciding to where to submit once they, they've um, gotten their results from the research. So when where do you choose to submit once you do have uh, a paper that you're ready to write? So our advice generally is to think about the journal you wanna to submit to before you start writing your paper. Different journals, different publications have different styles and guidelines. So it'll really help you as you write the paper to have in mind where you wanna submit and what those uh, requirements are. So look at all the journals that you might be interested in and think about kind of their aims and scopes and see if it fits in what you wanna publish. So there are some specific things to consider. Uh, think about the peer review. Uh, how rigorous is the peer review process for that publication? And look at the aims and scope. Uh, does your research fit in with the scope of the journal? And similarly, the, the relevance. Do, does your research fit in with other papers that are published in the journal? And that's gonna tell you if the readership is going to match and if you're going to reach the right people uh, if you publish your work in, in that journal. And of course, the reputation of the journal is important. Um, think, look at the journal metrics information to see um, how well known is the journal and um, how respected is it in the field. Other aspects to consider are the timelines to publication. If you have a short communication that you need published right away, uh, does the journal support that? Do they have some really quick peer review times for communications? If you have a really long comprehensive paper that you wanna publish, again, does the journal support that to publish a really long, um, large data sets? Uh, open access, we'll talk about this a bit more later, but um, are you required to publish in a fully open access journal or can you publish in a hybrid journal or does it not need to be open access? Uh, you also want to consider the language, um, the English language, if um, you're not a native English speaker and the audience of the journal, who is going to be reading your work. And also consider the, the indexing. Where is it uh, indexed and how easily will uh, your work be found if someone searches for it in something like Web of Science or Scopus? So this is just a, um, a general kind of about the journal page. This is for one of ours, Quarterly Journal of Engineering Geology and Hydrogeology. I'm not going to go into detail about all of the little um, images you have here, 
but uh, generally when you're researching your jour a journal to publish in, uh, go to this page to learn more about the journal. Uh, in the top right corner, you have the Lyle Collection logo. And if you wanna read the content of the journal, that's where you would go to um, read some of the papers that are published. In the bottom right corner, further information, we have guidelines for authors and a bit more about the editorial board. And again, that'll give you an idea of the kind of content that is published in the journal. So uh, we have a few guidelines of, of our own. So if you wanna publish in a GSL pay, uh, publication, uh, we have some author instructions, uh, top tips from the production team in the author resources section, and also some information about the publishing ethics. So we also have some editor top tips that we've uh, received from some of our editors. And um, generally it's really important to have a clear title. Uh, think carefully about your title because that's the first thing that people see. Uh, make sure uh, the key message is really delivered and clear. Think also about your abstract because a lot of search engines use the abstract. So that's gonna be the thing that brings readers to your paper. So make sure your abstract is clear and really tells the readers what the paper is about. And there are other things to consider as well about the make sure your language is polished and um, the style of the paper is um, easy to read and accessible. And there are lots of other things to consider. So, um, I just want to talk a little bit about open access publishing. I think most of you are very uh, already familiar with it. There are kind of two sides to open access publishing. The one that most of you are uh, familiar with is probably that it is making content freely available. So anyone can access and read your article if it's published under an open access license. The other side of it is that that content is freely reusable. So anyone can take an image or a bit of text from your work and reuse it somewhere else. They will cite your work that is required, but um, they don't need to ask permission to do that. So that's kind of the two aspects of open access publishing. Uh, there are a number of different types, but um, the two most popular are, we have gold open access publishing, and this is where the final version of record, the final version is published uh, online and it's freely available. Another type, and the author, sorry, for gold open access, the author needs to pay an article processing fee usually to make this possible. The other type that's quite common is green open access. And this is where an earlier version, so the newly accepted version before uh, typesetting and copy editing, that earlier version is made freely available. And sometimes depending on the publisher, there might be an embargo before this green version is available. So the Geological Society has a number of transformative agreements um, that they've uh, agreed with different uh, institutions. And um, these are also known as read and publish agreements where authors from these institutions are able to read all of the GSL content and also publish open access in GSL hybrid publications. Uh, so we have a couple right now that uh, we've uh, have contracts with, and that's with JISC and the Council of Australian University Librarians. And since this is um, a career talk uh, based in the UK, I've listed below the universities in JISC that are signed up uh, to this transformative agreement. So if you are part of one of these institutions, uh, you can publish in any GSL hybrid publication um, and the open access fee is waived. If you would like to be part of this and your institution isn't on this list, please let us know. So now I'm going to pass over to Helen where she can discuss the peer review process a bit. Thanks, Tricia. Yeah, so peer review is obviously an extremely important part of the process and single blind is currently used by most of the GSL journals with ES cubed the exception as this runs an open review model. The other types of peer review that are commonly used are double blind and post publication review. The peer review process works in the following way the journal manager or the in house editorial staff oversee the whole process and are available throughout to answer any queries. Upon submission, the designated subject editors make an initial assessment and comments can be returned to the author at this point with the decision or the paper can progress further in the process to additional specialist editors and onwards to full peer review. 
The reviewers communicate their assessments back via the editors who communicate the decision of the board along with marked scripts or lists of comments back to the author for revision. The length of time this process takes can vary. All GSL editors and reviewers give their time voluntarily. More information on the GSL journal timelines can be found on the metrics page of the GSL website that Tricia mentioned earlier. So what should you expect from peer review? Both the editorial board and reviewers are assessing your paper on the following criteria. The science, ensuring that good experimental practice has been followed, and what advancements your paper makes to the current understanding. Does your paper fit within the scope of the journal? The international impact your paper may make and that the conclusions are supported by the rest of the paper. Ensuring that all relevant literature has been examined and is correctly cited. Is the manuscript the correct length for the content covered? The article is original work and that it is of significance to the subject. And also that it's concise and the discussion flows well throughout the paper. Comments can be provided as anything from a short paragraph through to lists of detailed changes and marked up manuscripts with comments and queries. So how should you respond when submitting a revised manuscript? On the revised submission, you should provide either or both a track change manuscript or list of amends. Try to accept feedback with good grace. They are intended to help you improve your manuscript. Make sure to address all the reviewers' comments, even if you don't agree with them. If you don't agree, then explain why. Address each point specifically. Be assertive and persuasive rather than defensive or aggressive. Adhere to deadlines, but if you need more time, just ask. It's always good form to thank the reviewers. If the comments aren't clear, then do ask. All good editors will want to help. Some more top tips from our editors. Check the journal's homepage to ensure your submission is within its remit. Put your work in context, reference the existing research and literature where relevant, even if your work focuses on a local study. Consider how the findings relate to a broader context for the field. Ensuring that your results or case study are discussed in the context of the wider literature so that the relevance of the work to the scope of the journal is clear to the reader. Obviously do include your data, but don't just present the data as though it speaks for itself. Respond carefully to all the reviewer comments. Take time to produce a robust response to reviewer comments. Consider addressing the changes line by line. This is important for editor decision-making. Make sure the discussion and conclusions pick up and resolve the key points introduced in the aims and rationale. It's best to try to avoid any cliches. And here's a few links. So the top tips for authors uh, that we mentioned er earlier and the publication metrics pages and our ethics pages and um, information on open access. OK, and then on to promotion of your article. What can you do to promote your article? The publisher may post on LinkedIn or Twitter about your paper, but you can also do this. Provide a link to the published paper. The DOI link is usually the best one to use as this resolves wherever the user has access. Provide the highlights of your paper in your post. If it's newsworthy, then speak to your institution's press office. Also let the publisher know. If you write a blog, then write one based on your article. GSL have a blog and we occasionally post about our newsworthy papers. Altmetrics is a measure of the online activity surrounding your paper. The value is calculated from social media mentions from various sources such as LinkedIn, Twitter, etc. If you have an article published, you can keep track of its activity by downloading the Altmetrics bookmarklet, which the link is provided here. And back to Tricia for opportunities in publishing. All right, thanks, Helen. Um, so yeah, Helen and I have gone through a lot of um, the author experience. So uh, how to choose a journal, peer review process, and then Pu uh, publishing your journal and promoting it once it is published. Um, but there are other roles. And um, Helen touched a lot on the reviewer roles. Uh, these are predominantly volunteer roles. And there are a lot of volunteer roles in academic publishing. And like authors, it can be anyone, academics, industry re researchers, people in the government, at any stage of their career can be involved in academic publishing. So if you're volunteering, chances are this is only part uh, of um, 
a small part in what you do. You have a day job either in research and academia or some, somewhere else. Um, so this is, you know, enhancing and extra work upon um, additional work in your career. So again, reviewers, uh, this can take as little, uh, reviewing a paper can take as little as uh, a few hours or even a couple of days to review an article. And keep in mind that we usually need about two reviewers for every submission. So there are a number of people who um, review and help in the publication process with this. Um, if you are interested in making a bit more of a commitment, uh, editors tend to partner with a journal or a publication for at least a couple of years. And their roles are really varied as well. They can manage the peer review process and make decisions on whether to accept or reject submissions. Uh, they commission content or thematic collections. So inviting authors to submit to a journal or publication. And they also promote the publication. This can just be by word of mouth. Uh, a lot of publications are beginning to take on social media editors who really focus in on that part. Um, and also because, again, they're making a, a longer commitment of a few years at least to a particular publication, they really have an influence on the direction of that publication. So there are a number of reasons why people would be interested in doing this. I mean, primarily it's career development um, to really help out with this publication or journal. Um, chief editors or someone who's really involved in this kind of work might receive an honorarium um, or a travel stipend to travel to a conference when they can. Uh, or there are lots of other uh, benefits that a publication might offer uh, an editor or a reviewer. So in addition to the volunteer roles, there are careers in academic publishing. Both Helen and I uh, do this kind of as our main career. Uh, and there are some that are very similar actually to what a volunteer editor might do. And I've called that here an in-house editor. But again, the roles are actually quite similar. So you can be involved in scientific assessment and managing the peer review or making decisions, uh, commissioning content for um, thematic collections or reviews and also promoting the uh, content, so the publication. So attending conferences, promoting it on uh, social media, and again, inputting on the direction of the publication. So anyone in this role where it's kind of more of a career, they would still need a really strong background in the subject area. So if it's a geology journal, you would be expected to probably have at least a first degree in geology, if not a PhD. Uh, there are other roles as well in academic publishing. You have administrative roles or production that can be involved in copy editing or typesetting or the publication itself. Uh, marketing and sales as well uh, usually um, are kind of in-staff roles. And moving slightly away from academic publishing, uh, you can be a content editor. So I have uh, an example here of Geoscientist, which is a magazine that we offer um, to our members of the Geological Society. Uh, so you have the content editor who kind of decides what goes in and then science writers to contribute to things like this or blogs. And these positions can be either freelance or volunteer. So that is a really quick overview of um, different careers in publishing, volunteering and publishing and generally how the publication process works. So thank you very much for listening. Thanks, Ray. All right, so I'll pass over now um, to my colleagues, um, David Boyt, who's head of editorial development um, at the Publishing House at the Geological Society, and Bethan Phillips, who is the commissioning editor at the Geological Society. Um, thank you for joining um, me today. Um, so I'm just having a look in the Q&A to see if there's specific questions yet. Um, so if um, you have any questions for Bethan and David, please put them in the Q&A box. Um, David, um, would you like to kick us off? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Becky. Um, yeah, we'll keep an eye out for any questions coming in from uh, people on the call. Uh, I know there's an awful lot of information there given about publishing. Um, we can, I think, share the slides with everybody after the fact, and certainly we're both available, Beth and I, for any email questions coming through. Um, very pleased to be here uh, and, and to be talking about careers in geoscience. Uh, I do feel slightly like an imposter because I am actually not a geoscientist by training, um, unless geography counts, which I've been told it does not. Um, <laughs> but uh, 
my colleague Bethan on the call is uh, a geoscientist by training um, and has a PhD. Um, so perhaps while we wait for other questions to come through, Bethan, perhaps I could ask of you, um, what was it that attracted you to a career in publishing and how did you kind of, you know, get started with the Geological Society and the publishing house? Uh, yeah, thanks David, and thanks, thank you for having us today. It's really great to be here. Um, so yeah, as David said, I, I did an undergraduate degree in geology and then I did PhD in kind of geochemistry and igneous petrology. And as I was finishing up the PhD, um, I really enjoyed it. It was a brilliant opportunity, but I really kind of focused in on very, very niche subjects. And so the thing I think that attracted me most to publishing was being able to kind of get back into that really broad array of geology. You know, the great thing about geology and geosciences is that it covers so much. Um, and so getting the opportunity to work with all of these different kind of branches of research really, really attracted me. I was really lucky um, that as I finished up my PhD, um, a job opened up at the publishing house. So it was just, it was perfect timing. Um, so luck had a lot to do with it. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, now that I, I've worked in publishing for a couple of years, um, the thing that I really like um, is just the variety of the job. No day is the same, which is just really great. Um, yeah, what about you, David? What attracted you to publishing? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, there was less, I suppose, on the uh, on the science side, uh, although I did start working out on the geography list um, for Taylor and Francis, another publisher, a little while ago now. But um, yeah, similarly, I think uh, the opportunity to contribute to something that I thought was very worthwhile and, um, you know, uh, to engage with those who are engaged with the, the science and with the subjects, which is always fascinating. It's not exactly... Um, we don't come into contact with the science directly ourselves necessarily, but obviously being involved in, in the uh, communicating of science is, is feels like a good uh, thing to be doing as a career. And I think, as you say, Bethan, it is, it is a very varied um, kind of career in publishing. Uh, there's always a lot to do, especially with a smaller society type publisher like the Geological Society, where our staff is quite, you know, it's in the tens rather than, say, the hundreds compared to some of the bigger publishers. What does a typical week look like for you both? Um, what kind of things do you get up to? Well, it varies depending on your position, Becky, um, but Bethan and I are both part of the editorial department. Um, so chiefly, um, it is our role to um, be out there in the community and talking to uh, researchers and to scientists about publishing with um the Geological Society in one of the journals or the books, um, which were indicated in the slides. So it's, it's, it revolves around that, as well as setting up those publications to um, be able to publish, to have the correct policies, to have um, the editorial teams. We liaise directly with the uh, chief scientific editors and the editorial boards. Uh, we're involved in, in uh, recruiting to those boards as well. Um, and so it's kind of all the behind, uh, behind the scenes stuff um, that, uh, you know, gets, the, gets the, the, the research from, you know, the writers, the authors, the scientists to uh, the point of, of publication, if you like, um, and all the kind of infrastructure that goes into that. And, uh, you know, it can be quite a competitive arena publishing. So we, we you know, want to be having direct conversations with our contributors um, to you know, find out where their priorities are and, and how this, the society can can meet that. But um, Bethan in particular is, is involved, involved centrally with commissioning, um, which obviously means lots of conversations, doesn't it, Bethan, with our contributors? Yeah, which is great. That's my favourite part of the job, is getting to talk to researchers and, you know, practitioners and finding out what they're doing and what they find interesting and what they think is coming up next. And a lot of my time is spent you know, looking for new content and yeah, talking to people, um, which I really enjoy. It's a, yeah, it's a fun job. Um, so what do you both like best within the role? Um, can you expand? I think you kind of briefly touched on things, um, but if you can expand on that a bit. Yeah, sure. I mean, I, as I say, I think it's a, uh, it's a combination of, of being involved, even though I'm not a, a subject specialist, I'm not a scientist. Um, it's being involved in, in the sharing of science, which of course is so crucial to so many things within academia, within research and within the community itself, but also beyond, you know, 
the society has some big themes that it's just recently been launching around the energy transition um, and around geohazards and geo geoengineering. Um, and obviously these things are important within the community and the research community and industry, but they, as I say, they have implications for wider society um, and for the way that we all kind of interact with each other. So, you know, being involved in that in some way, uh, I find personally quite rewarding. And of course, you know, collaborating with uh, those who are subject specialists, those who, uh, you know, are very much in the know when it comes to the, to the science is, uh, you know, again, I find that really exciting. And hopefully, you know, in the not too distant future, those kind of interactions will not only be here in the virtual world, but also back in the real world at academic conferences, at meetings, um, at the society's uh, offices in, in London and so forth. So, yeah, looking forward to getting back to that as well. Yeah, I mean, exactly what David said. I think you kind of hit the nail on the head there, but um, yeah, just getting to communicate science and to hopefully kind of provide a, a platform and an avenue for, for people to, to publish and to communicate their science, especially, you know, people who maybe aren't traditionally kind of getting that platform. That's, I think, really important to us. Super. Um, so we're about to take a um, 15 minute break and then we're heading into the next session. Um, but Beth and David, do you have any parting words of wisdom to students to pass on uh, regarding to either getting work published or um, if you're kind of interested in pursuing publishing as a full time career, any kind of last um, tidbits of advice? Uh, well, if I take the publishing one, perhaps Beth and as our geoscientists can take the careers one. But um, yeah, I would say I'm not sure, you know, in terms of the audience who's in a position to be publishing, but all contributing perhaps to, uh, you know, a uh, co-authored paper with uh, some of their colleagues. But do consider the Geological Society's publications. Um, we do have a specific interest as a society to be supporting um, early career researchers. And uh, so... You know, our editors are aware of that, our peer reviewers, you know, are, we communicate to them on that. And, um, you know, it's, it's our publications and our books are there as a, you know, an opportunity for, you know, those who aren't perhaps so experienced of authors to get that experience. Um, so do keep an eye out for those publications. And if there are any questions about, you know, uh, specific things to do with papers or, or uh, uh, publications to submit to them, as I say, uh, people can follow up with us via email, certainly happy to talk to people about that. Great. Would you be able to put your um, contact in the chat box? Sure, um, yes. Yeah. Thanks. And Bethan, sorry, I was about to kind of... Okay. Um, yeah, I think same as David, you know, if you have any questions about starting a career in publishing, we'd be very happy to answer any questions or kind of provide any advice. Um, I think... The, what I would recommend doing is maybe just reading around a little bit about kind of publishing in the industry and, and what's going on. And so just have that bit of background, but um, part of it is down to luck and timing as well. Just don't give up. Um, there's lots of jobs out there. So it's a, it's a great career to be involved in. Super. Well, thank you both for joining me. Um, and um, David's put his um, contact in the chat box. Um, so if you have any questions, do get in touch um, with David. Um, there'll be a short break um, now. We'll return at 2.30 for a session on GIS and remote sensing um, with Charlotte Bishop, Iqbal Hussain and Devon Scanlan. So um, I'll see you at 2.30. Thanks, everyone. Thanks all. Bye for now.
Hi everyone and welcome back. Um, I hope you've all had a nice break and had the opportunity to grab a cup of tea. Um, so the next session is on GIS and remote sensing. Um, with me today, um, I've got Charlotte Bishop, I've got Ekbel Hussain and Devon Scanlan. Um, so um, Charlotte, um, could you kick us off please with your um, presentation and an introduction? Yes, absolutely. And uh, thank you, everyone, for, for joining us today. And I'll just share my screen. So, OK, let me just hang on, put it into presentation mode. OK, Becky, you can see that OK? Thumbs up. I can see black at the minute, but it could be oh, no. a bit slow. What can everyone else see? Ekbal, Devan, can you see? Still black. black, yeah. Cool, that's not a good start, right? Let's try that again. Hang on a second. It says you're sharing the screen, but nothing's being shared. Okay, let's try this. Still, Still not working? Possibly. No. Mm. Oh, okay. I've got the PowerPoint up. Yeah, I uh <laughs> okay, let's try let's try again. It's uh I'm gonna close actually do you know what I'll do? I'll just share my whole screen and then maybe that's gonna be easier. And then I'll just navigate to the PowerPoint and do that. Can, is that any better? Can you see that now? Not yet. Maybe give it a second. Yeah. Um, perhaps if Charlotte, you send me your presentation um, yes. whilst I'm bringing it up, Ekbal or Devon, would you like to jump in first? Let's do it that way around. Yes, apologies. <laughs> um, do you mind going? Do you want me to share? Yep. Okay. Go ahead and. Okay. Hopefully, you guys can see mine. Yep. I okay, um, so just a couple of minutes to everyone. Hello, everyone. Thanks for the invitation to talk, by the way. But so I'm going to just talk a couple of minutes about um, basically my path to where I am now and a little bit of introduction to myself. Um, I'm Ekbal. I work at the British Geological Survey as a remote sensing geoscientist, but also I'm the topic lead for multi hazard systems at the British at the survey. So happy to answer questions on that. And these photos are basically the top photos of my favorite colleague. Um, it's actually one of the great things of being working where I am. I get to travel a lot. And this was an incredible photo I took in Ethiopia. And it's a model of the earliest child uh, with 3.3 million year old skeleton from an earliest child. I also get you know, quite a nice opportunity to work here, go to NASA JPL a couple of years ago. And, I'll talk about all the travels at some point. Ask me about them in the, in the Q&A if you want. A little bit about my career. So um, I guess as most of us started off doing my A-levels in Birmingham, next to the Cadbury Chocolate Factory. So I could smell the chocolate from where I used to study. Uh, then I took a gap year uh, I was a teaching assistant for a year. I did my undergraduate and uh, an undergraduate master. So that four years extended undergraduate at Cambridge in natural sciences. Actually, I went to university to, I wanted to do astrophysics because I was more interested in like stars and planets than I was about the earth. But as these things happen, um, I became very interested in geology. And so I, I eventually specialized in uh, earth sciences in Cambridge. And then I went off to do a PhD at the University of Leeds in geophysics and satellite geodesy, which was really good. So I got to combine my interest in satellites and earth in, into one sort of program there, which was great fun, four years there. And then I did a year again in Leeds, 
a postdoc uh, working on seismic hazard and risk in, in Chile, in Santiago. And then since then, I've been at the BGS as a remote sensing geoscientist. And, and, and recently, I've also had the additional responsibility of multi-hazard systems lead at the BGS here. So what's next? I don't know. Uh, we'll shall, we shall see. Um, I don't plan to leave the BGS anytime soon. Um, I have lots of interesting things to do here. So yeah, not moving anytime soon. And what do I do at the BGS? Um, basically this stuff, uh, remote sensing, applied remote sensing to understand the problems in, in, in earth sciences using INSAR, seismic hazard, urban subsidence and multi-hazard dynamics. The BGS site in Keyworth, where I, where I work, is absolutely beautiful. Uh, if you have the chance to visit, please do visit us. Um, uh, and, uh, when all the COVID rules are, are relaxed and everything, and we open the site back up to visitors, please do visit. We are a public organisation, so it's open to all of you to visit. Um, we have a wonderful geological walkway and an, an entire cathedral of rock cores uh, you can have a look at. And this is the bread and butter of what I do, remote sensing work. This is an internal map of, of Indonesia. A lot of the work I do is actually abroad in low-income countries, looking at hazard and risk um, issues there. And also multi-hazard dynamics. This is something else I'm very interested in. Um, we're working with that on that in Istanbul, Kathmandu, Quito, and Nairobi. Um, something else I do, I give lots of training courses around the world on using remote sensing technologies to help address whatever problem those communities are, are, are interested in. And I do lots of outreach and science communication. This is something that I'm, I'm particularly passionate about. Uh, I give lots of talks. I don't. I, I very rarely turn down the invitation to talk at an event on this time issue stick in. So why do remote sensing? I thought I'd just give a really quick slide on that. But before you know, I talk about this, I need to include this really important contribution to my slides. And that's from my cat, who was helping me make these slides the other day. Uh, and so why do we do remote sensing? I love this, this image from the Geological Society. It's a couple of years old now, but I think it's amazing because it really encompasses everything about geology and the geology of, of the future. Um, so I traditionally have worked in these sort of fields, volcanology, geohazards and seismology, using remote sensing as a tool to underpin our understanding of these. But in the last few years, I've been involved in all of these stuff as well, geomorphology, geophysics, carbon capture, engineering, geology, hydrogeology, environmental protection, research, policy, contaminated land. So remote sensing really feeds into or underpins almost all these things that with remote sensing. And I really want to stress that the grand challenges of the future that we all have to worry about, and particularly you guys will have to worry about, whether that's climate change, energy, mineral resources, you know, the, the green transition, these all have to be underpinned by geology and geoscientists and which have a component of remote sensing. So I, I can't stress how important this is for you guys. So just before, this was the last slide, uh, I asked just this morning some of my colleagues who are sitting in the room behind, beside me, what advice they would give to prospective budding uh, remote sensing uh, students. And this is by far the most important advice, learn how to code. And um, it's really, really, really useful tool. It's not a requirement and it's by, by no means it's a necessity, but by learning to code, and especially if you can get some of this experience in machine learning, it puts you into a really, really strong position to, to be able to, you know, career-wise and even op opens up lots of opportunities. So I recommend that for sure. And also rem remember that, you know, field work is not a necessity. I haven't been into the field for about 10 years now, and I, couldn't tell, I can't tell one rock from, uh, from another, but I still consider myself a geologist. So don't worry if you've, you've been missing out on field work over the last couple of years because of COVID. It's not always a requirement. Some of my colleagues said, talk to people who do things that you're not. Uh, you may open your sort of horizons a little bit about what other options there are available, particularly events like this. And actually, my, I met my job, my current, my boss and his boss at the Geological Society and at an event like this. And so when I was a student, I met them. And a couple of years later, they, I, they sent me an email saying, oh, we, are, we have a job opening. You should apply. So actually, you don't. I can't understate how important it is to get yourself out there, talk to people, tell them what you're interested in. 
And really important is, you know, think about where the future of geoscience is. That last slide, you know, where are the big challenges in the future? And where are your interests? And align them together. And then think about what skills you need to sort of work on, develop to sort of fit yourself onto that, those trajectories. And the last slide, because you saw a picture of my other cat, and this one was going to get a bit jealous, so I included her as well. And she did also make a valuable contribution to the slides, but it's in the it's in the notes section at the bottom. Um, and please feel to, feel to contact me on any of these Twitter, LinkedIn, email, etc., uh, for any advice, tips, or if you want to do like a master's project or bachelor's project with me. Um, and also, if you're if you're getting towards the end of your studies uh, and you want to think about doing a PhD. This is my turn to plug. Um, I have a PhD advertised at the moment with Cardiff University, looking at multi hazards from post earthquake, very big landslides from post, post very big landslides after earthquakes in China. So email me if you like more information on that. Thank you. Super, okay. thanks, Iqbal. Um, so um, I now have Charlotte's slides, um, but um, Devon, would you like to um, go next and then I'll finish the presentations with Charlotte? Yeah, as long as Charlotte's okay with that. Fine by me. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, let me share my screen. Uh, oh, hold on. Oh no, wrong one, sorry. Let me know when you can see my screen. Am I showing the wrong one? Um, I can see it, it looks, it looks right to me. Is it the full screen, this yeah. one? Okay, perfect. <laughs> what two, because it's come up on two for some reason. Um, okay, so. I'm uh, Devon, I'm a project GIS cartographer at Frugro. Um, so I, <laughs> basically live my life looking at a computer. Um, so my journey, as probably the most cliche thing to say, is hasn't exactly been straightforward. Um, I started at the University of Plymouth in geology um, and ended up going to do a master's in geological hazards because I have an obsession with volcanoes and earthquakes. Um, so that just seemed like the logical thing for me to do. Um, unfortunately, when I came out of university, it wasn't the best time for jobs. So it was very much kind of see what I can get into that's the best for me. Um, I worked at Tesco's throughout university and it paid for my master's pretty much. Um, I tried being a geography teacher. Wasn't my best moment. Um, very political. Don't get me wrong. I would never say for someone not to do it, but it just wasn't for me at the time. Uh, I then tried temping because it just seemed like a good idea to get um, office training because I hadn't worked in an office the entire time. Although I'd been customer facing, it didn't, didn't always work as well. Um, and then from that, I actually got my first GIS job with Scient, who work for the Royal Payments Agency. So they, they make sure that farmers get paid the right amount. So making sure that the boundary is correct and making sure that every farmer is paid fairly, basically. Um, from that, I then moved to Savills, which definitely isn't geology, ba uh, geology based. It's uh, commercial and uh, residential homes instead and working with telecoms. Um, I stayed there for about two years and then I moved to Frugro in 2018. Um, it definitely appealed to me because it was much more in the geoscience kind of realm of what I enjoyed um, so I get to use data that actually I do understand more than I thought I would um, didn't understand it as much when I first started because I hadn't looked at anything geology wise for a very very long time um, but now I really enjoy it and I actually got promoted to project GIS cartographer earlier this year um, it was meant to be last year but due to covid everything just got put on hold um, so yeah it wasn't the most straightforward um, way but I got there in the end so my day-to-day -day kind of thing is um, as a project cartographer um, it's leading on projects so it's working with clients making sure they get everything that they should um, and they want out of a uh, out of a project so um, whether it's your databases that I'm creating or charts making sure that what they get is 
what's expected um, and making sure it's the highest standard. Um, I also work on survey planning. So when the boats go out and do the survey, so I predominantly work on renewable energy, um, so wind farms. So when we're going out on the boats to do that, I'll work with the geophysics team to make sure that we've got the right spacing for what they need and the right lines so they don't go off course. So if they're slightly off, it can cause a lot of problems. Um, so yeah, and that's, it's quite interesting. I think working with the clients is some of the best part because you get to change what you're doing and you get to have a chat with them and, and network as well with them to make it more interesting. And also you get to look at pretty pictures. So like all the bathy and stuff like that and just see exactly what, because I work in marine predominantly, um, I get to see what the sea, the sea floor looks like, which most people don't get to. Um, Okay, so standing out for me, obviously mine was a bit hit and miss, but my advice would be take all opportunities, is making sure that everything that is offered to you or something that you can go for, go for it. Make sure you make the most of it, especially at university. Um, they're always exactly, exactly like this, is there's always networking opportunities. Uh, volunteering and getting involved with geological uh, charities. I actually... I think it was in my third year I did some posters for geology for global development um, and that was something that it was a fantastic day as well that I got to go to the geological society chat to people of like like-minded and also feel like I was doing something to help people um, geology can be that it very much comes across as it's not it's just killing the earth sometimes I think is sometimes how it comes across to some people who have no idea actually there are so many people out there that just want to help and stop climate change and help the communities that live on these um, hazardous areas um, also as Ekbal said is networking making sure you make yourself known going to these events um, and also investing in yourself I think for me like I've actually just started doing my prints too which is a project management um, system that you can like use and I'm going to use it in my everyday work but also it means in the future that I can really use that and promote myself that way. Um, so investing in yourself is unbelievably important. Um, and finally, this probably looks a little bit cheesy, a little bit cliche, but no one is the same. And please, please, please do not ever feel disheartened by the fact that you're, the way you're doing things is different to the person next to you. Everyone has a different way of doing things. Not everyone's going to get the same opportunities. Um, so, yeah, so just do what you can and don't feel disheartened if it's different. Um, obviously, feel free to uh, link on LinkedIn if you want to, if you've got any recruitment queries. This is from my company because we're sponsoring it. Um, obviously, feel free to contact Liz. Um, yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Devon. <laughs> That's great. Um, I'll try sharing um, one minute. Hopefully you have better luck, Becky, than I did. So I apologise, everyone, about the, uh, the the rearrangement of the session because of tech issues. But uh, OK, at least I can see the slides. So that's that's a good start. <laughs> happens. Um, <laughs> right, um, so I'll okay. keep yeah perfect thank you uh yes thank thank you so much to the geological society for in inviting me here um to talk about uh what, what i do and to be part of a panel with uh, some really interesting speakers so i'm kind of pleased in some ways i kind of went last actually because i think it was really nice to hear what what they what they uh do before i spoke um but my name's charlotte bishop and i'm a senior project manager at a company called ksat um, and KSAT is based in the north of Norway. So I, I'm British, but I live in Tromsø, which is in the very north of Norway. Uh, and the view you see on the screen with the antennas, that's on the site that I work on here. So a big part of what KSAT does is actually talk to the satellites that are passing and orbiting around our uh, globe. Um, and we do this over... I think it's something crazy like 24 different sites across the world that we have antenna stations and we also are the world's largest antenna station for communicating with satellites. Um, but also the part of the business that I work in is Earth Observation Site. So 
Uh, unlike my colleagues on this call, I am not a geologist, um, but I'm a geographer and a remote sensor, and I have been working with geological applications for a long time. But I guess my the reason I'm saying this is because as I think we've probably heard, and you may have heard in other careers talks as well, there are so many different routes to get into geoscience applications, get into geological related positions that you don't have to come necessarily from a geological background. Um, we have lots of people in, in our organization who come from maths and physics background, not geological um, by, by training, who, who still work and can you know, contribute hugely into to the work that we do. Um, and the other uh, role that I have is also as the Geological Remote Sensing Group Chairman. Uh, that is a special interest group of the Geological Society and also the, rem the Remote Sensing and Photogrammetry Society. I've been the chairman now for five years. Uh, I got re-elected two years ago and then uh, because of COVID, we haven't actually been able to have uh, our normal conference in person. So we've had, uh, this will be our second year of a, of a virtual conference this year. Um, but it's, it's a really fantastic organization. I'll place the, the link to it in the chat. Um, we're a fully voluntary group from a range of different organizations that come together to plan uh, events where people from the geological and remote sensing community can, can share their ideas, what they're up to um, in, a, in a very uh, informal, but kind of peer led way uh, through our international conference. Um, it's a professional conference, but it's a very relaxed atmosphere. And, and those who, who attend it find it's a great way, particularly early in your career, uh, to, to meet to meet other people and I know uh, as Devon and Ekbal said that talking to other people is a, is a really big part of, of the process in your career. Uh, so as you can see there I, from a, a study point of view and I, I have a timeline later but I don't mention this again so I, I started with a, a bachelor's in physical geography from Reading and then I did a master's in remote sensing at UCL and uh, at the time it was uh, combined with Imperial College um, before I moved into, into my career. So next slide, Becky. Okay, so I, I added lots of images onto my slides to kind of show, <laughs> show the different types of things that, that, that we do at, um, at CASA or that, that we as um, remote sensors in, in this kind of field do um, and what I do day to day. So uh, the types of work that I get involved in is quite many and varied. I work a lot with customers. That's I'm a project manager, so that's kind of very important to my to my role is actually speaking to our clients, making sure that they're getting the um, the products that we are preparing for them on time, that they meet their specifications, and a lot of that type of work is analysing satellite imagery. I, I don't travel into the field. Uh, the only the times I leave the office, which I do quite a lot, is for training and conferences um, and, and meeting clients. Um, I, it's not going into the field to do any ver verification or validation, um, but there's a lot obviously we're, when we're talking about remote sensing data there's a lot of information we can gain from an image alone and then it's it's really fantastic to work with customers who take that imagery and go that next step and actually do the validation process or the verification and and add extra value to the information they see from the imagery um, and I, re I really love analyzing data. I work with data from a range of spatial resolutions from the very, very detailed data, um, all the way to the, the much larger kind of regional scale data. So Landsat data um, and you know, the public sources of, of information. And, and there's so much different types of information that we can extract from those data sets. So I just added some examples on the right hand side of some of those things. So. Uh, there's elevation models there, there's feature extraction for roads, there's oil spills or pipeline leaks on land, um, fire detection, environmental applications, and change detection as well. So lots of different things, many of which are related to geology, but not all. Uh, and for me, I find that's really um, good in my job to have a lot of variety, but also I really like the fact that so many of these activities that we do are very much related to geological applications. Next slide, Becky. Um, so I'll, I'll keep this one quite brief, but it was uh, just to kind of highlight some of the different types of projects and the types of people that I work with. So um, in terms of customers, we have a very, um, most of our customers are from oil and gas. 
Um, so we work with major oil and gas companies, we work with mining companies uh, and engineering, and a little bit on the environment side as well, um, providing different types of services. So they could be standardised reporting on oil spill, for example. So the image on the bottom right is uh, oil spill detection over uh, an incident that's happened. Um, and we can provide regular reports with very quick turnaround times because of the antenna system that, that KSAT has and its arrangement with the operators. Um, and then we also do a lot of research projects as well. We work with universities. Um, we, we work to support PhD and master's students with projects. We've just finished one actually with a, a student doing something more on environmental topics, but uh, we have quite a range of different applications. Um, and a lot of those students then end up coming to work for us as well, which is fantastic. And then lots of different ways of training uh, and different things that I have found helpful throughout my career is, is having the availability and a role to, to develop personally, and I, this has been raised by, by the others as well, the value of training courses, of attending conferences, of networking at different events and, and not feeling not, it's, it can be quite difficult at first, I think, to, to go to an event and start talking to other people. But it's, uh, you know, I, what I have found is that actually people are very friendly. They're very happy to share their experiences as well. So sometimes it's that courage to take that first step is uh, is, is really worthwhile. Um, and then for me, being part of committees has been a, a major help. Um, and Devon mentioned it as well. Uh, being part of the GRSG, I also sit on the development committee of the Geological Society. I've been an editor for a, a journal, um, associate editor, sorry, for a journal. Um, and just various things that I've had the opportunity to get involved with over the years have been really positive um, for, for me and, and my personal development. Next slide, Becky. I think, oh yeah, this you might want to click through, Becky, just to make sure it all loads. Yeah, that's everything. Oh. <laughs> Uh, great. This is my last slide. Um, so this is my timeline slide, I guess um, I can just talk around briefly. So school, as with the others, um, GCSEs, A-levels, I went to university and did my undergrad. Um, I then didn't really know what I wanted to do. And my personal tutor said, well, what were you interested in? I said, oh, I kind of like the stuff we did re with remote sensing, which was a tiny component of my whole degree. Um, and he said, oh, well, if, you, if you're serious about that, you, there is a master's course you could do in it. And there's a company in, um, in Kent, which is where I'm from, um, that, that does this. You might want to take a look. And so I actually knew someone that worked there and found out that this was actually only 10 or 15 miles away from where I lived. And I kind of took a chance and you know, sent them a message and said, did they have any work experience opportunities? And they did at the time. And I, I spent a year there before I did my master's. And then I went back to that company and that company was NPA, which was Nigel Press Associates. It was then subsequently bought by Fugro. And then a few years after that, it was bought by CGG. So it's now part of, of the, the bigger CGG group, which is a big seismic and oil and gas consultancy. Um, and I was there for 12 years doing um, a project management, um, remote sensing specialist uh, applications. Uh, I have a particular focus on optical satellite imagery. So that, that kind of developed during that time. Um, and then I decided I wanted to try something different, a little bit different at least. So I moved to Terrobotics, which was a startup um, working on terrain analysis and extracting information from satellite data for um, different types of terrain applications. Um, but the startup life for me wasn't, it didn't really fit um, with, with how I like to work. Um, and an opportunity came up in Norway. I never thought I'd leave the UK, but um, the opportunity opportunity came up and it was too good to to miss so I have now been in Norway for over just over three years working at KSAT and have you know it's, it's still fantastic because of the technology we have uh, and the ability to travel at least until you know the last couple of years to be able to go back to the UK regularly to still be able to support the the committee for the GRSG and be involved in other other things um, just by, by virtue of, of the networks and, and such that, that I've built over that time. So I think I'll leave it there because I'm con conscious we don't have too much left for questions. So, and I can see that there are quite a lot in the chat. So Becky, I think, I think I'll leave it there for my slides and then maybe we can go to the, um, go to the Q and A and see what, 
questions we have. Awesome. Okay, we've got a question actually for, for you, Ekbal, but maybe uh, Devon may have some comments as well on coding languages. Oh, yes. Yeah. So I mentioned about the coding. I should say, before I answer that question, that it's not an absolute requirement to learn coding. Uh, it, it's just, from my point of view, seeing the tra trajectory of where things are going now, particularly in remote sensing, is that we're getting a lot of data now. The availability of satellites and the data volume is so large now, it's becoming really difficult to manually look through them all. So increasingly, certainly in the research field that I'm involved in, we're thinking of, okay, how can we extract information from a very large stack of data? And that's increasingly turning us towards AI and machine learning and using more um, algorithmic ways of extracting information. But it's not a requirement. I should say that very first. You, it's more, I think it's more important for you to, to have some skills in GIS, whatever that is, QGIS, ArcGIS, whatever, whichever platform you choose and understand spatial data sets than Python programming. However, if you do want to make yourself, distinguish yourself a little bit more, uh, certainly in the research elements, and probably in the, in the, in the, indus in the industry as well, then the coding is a really good sort of tool to have in your toolkit. Um, if you're new to coding, um, I recommend learning a bit of Python. Um, it doesn't really matter. The, the coding is more about learning the logic behind creating algorithms. But I recommend Python because it seems everyone seems to be using it these days and it's designed and everything else seems to fit in quite nicely to it. Um, and for machine learning, uh, there are loads of modules online uh, on GitHub, on, on Coursera and places like that where you can just find lots of machine learning um, uh, tutorials and courses. They're all free. So definitely go on there. And many of them are, are linked to remote sensing as well. So the European Space Agency has courses, has, has a MOOC, or they're called Massively Online Courses. Um, and so yeah, yeah, sign up to those. I recommend it. And Python and AI. And don't worry about what flavor of machine learning. It's all more about learning how the process works. There are loads of flavors and you can't possibly learn them all. Um, just try and experiment, see where it is you can find your interests. Thanks. Yeah, we'd, I was <laughs> just going to ask you, Devin, if, if you had any comments. Yeah, I completely second everything Ekbal said. Um, it's not a massive requirement. I will be honest, uh, Python and coding is not my strongest point. Um, mm. I'm still trying to learn it. Um, <laughs> and my um, the person, my colleague, he's a couple of years behind me, so still graduate level, he's picking up a lot quicker than I am. Um, but yeah, I would say Python is definitely the first one to go to. It seems to be the easiest one to pick up first. Um, I actually had a course on Java the other day and it completely scrambled my brain. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it's definitely something I think is going to be a big thing in the future. Um, automating everything and making it quicker so you can produce things at a faster rate is definitely something I think clients are looking for as well. Um, so yeah, I, it's not a massive requirement, but it's definitely something to look into and invest in because I think, as like Val said, it's the trajectory of GIS. I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and I I would agree completely. I'm also not a coder, um, and I agree that it's definitely not a requirement. But I think it is something that that we're seeing, uh, as uh, Devon says, like customers want things quicker and quicker. Um, there is a kind of drive for you know, more productivity and all this all this kind of thing as well that um, increasing production rate relies on machine learning and coding and automation of of some of the processes that we have, and um, some of that is is more kind of like developing these chains or customizing, but also working with people that know how to do those things. You don't necessarily have to have those skills. They can also be outsourced. My company also outsources as well as having skills in house. It's not always possible to do all of the activities that we want to do just with the team that we have, even though it's quite a large team. It's, uh, so it's, it's, uh, it's not a requirement. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't worry too much about that, but certainly I think the suggestions that Ekbal has on some of the free courses would be a really good place to start if you're interested to learn a little bit more. Um, there was a good question here that, um, let me just find it. Uh, where is it? Oh, here we go. Uh, is a master's in remote sensing required for a job in that field or would self-taught online classes be considered as experience for a job in that field on top of a geology degree? Um, certainly, I. I 
I'm not a geologist, but I did remote sensing. Um, but it is absolutely not a requirement for a job in remote sensing. And I think Ekbal um, and Devon as well have, have shown that their backgrounds are not a remote sensing from a, an academic standpoint, but that they, um, you know, that, that their roles have led into using remote sensing or GIS tools as part of that. So. Um, no, I, I, it helped me and it was a topic that I was interested in. So I think that that's really the crux of it. it it's finding what's interesting for you and then a career path that um, that makes sense to your passions and motivations. Um, Ekbal or Devon, do you have any comments to that one? Devon? Uh, yeah, I don't think it's a requirement. Um, I did literally two modules on GIS. I chose to do GIS uh, as a module in my third year um, because I was interested in it because I'd done something like it before. Um, and it was a random module in my master's and it was because I was good at it and I enjoyed it was mm. why I ended up going into it when it was obviously a bit of a tough time for jobs anyway and that was the one that was flourishing um, and yeah so I don't think it's a requirement I think if you want to get into it then absolutely fine find other courses that you want to do there's plenty of universities that you can find um, but yeah I think if you're enjoying it then pursue it you don't have to have just the qualifications I don't think that's weirdly how life seems to be at the moment it's yeah. having a qualification is great but it's also being interested in it and in enthusiasm I think as well I guess just to add on to that is that, that I think there's nothing wrong than being self-taught um, just as you know just as long as you can demonstrate that you know for a job application that you've got the skills a job needs um, whether show an example maybe of something you've done uh, it, it doesn't have to be in a degree course or anything like that in my opinion and for me personally JS is just a means to an end I'm interested in problems and whether that's in tectonics and natural hazards or subsidence or or disaster risk I'm interested in those problems remote sensing is just a tool I use to help me understand or answer those problems so it's just a means to an end to me it's not I, I'm not a remote sensor for the sake of being a remote sensor <laughs> sorry <laughs> no, no, that's, but that, that's part of the point right I think it's it's the I know and I've I've worked um with, with many people who have geological experience who then have by virtue of their career path gone into using it for remote sensing as well so or sorry using remote sensing to answer their those challenges um and because of their geological knowledge it gives them a different understanding of what they're seeing in the imagery um, I, I come at it from an image analysis point of view, so I can I can analyze an image, I can extract the features of interest, but I work with a geologist to help put that into context and help explain what we're seeing. Um, so a lot of a lot of my work historically has been on on mapping for, for minerals. Um, I did a lot of that before I, I moved to to Norway. I do slightly less of that now, but it's the same kind of approach. It's it's spectral analysis, it's it's feature extraction, and then you know building that kind of context with with the other knowledge of, the, of other people in your team. And, and I think that's that's something I, I find really, really beneficial with like remote sensing is so broad in how it's applied and GIS are so broad. Um, they kind of cover so many aspects and so many different jobs. It's it's uh, incredible now how how widespread it is. Um, we have a there's a good question here about um, networking. Yeah, how do you recommend we network ourselves? I'm assuming that means how how to how to kind of get started and get out there and, and meet other people. And um, I guess I I would say if that if you have a subject area that you're interested in, there's, there may well be a special interest group that the Geological Society already has. That would be a great place to start um, because they have special interest groups on a lot of geological topics, remote sensing, engineering, geohazards, um, archaeology, um, uh, disasters. Uh, there's lots of lots of different specialist interest groups out there, that many of which are free to join and a great way to meet other people. Um, obviously, right now, not so easy to have in-person events, um, but uh, but they will for sure start again from, from next year. And they're normally a, a really good way to meet other people. That's how I I started meeting other people, to be honest, and I actually then took that opportunity to join a committee. I've been part of the GRSG for over 10 years, um, and I, I have found that invaluable to meet other people from across the world um, and, and hear more about different applications of remote sensing. 
Um, it's it's scary to start. I, I admit I found that really challenging, but I I really once I once I took that step, I really found it it beneficial to to do that. And and I think same goes for looking at training, kind of finding those interest areas that can help you reach out to um, a professional via LinkedIn or someone that you've seen at the, the these careers events and just ask them some questions as well. Uh, most people are really happy to share their experiences and tips um, and are, are quite uh, approachable. Um, Devon Ekbald, comments from your side? Well, as Becky's just linked, student oh. leadership to the Joel Sock is perfect. Actually, yes. Um, I met my boss at a Joel Sock event. And oh, I got you did? Oh, yeah. brilliant. <laughs> it wasn't a careers day event, it was another one of the events that the Joel Sock runs. It may have been a GFGD event, actually. Um, so, and I met my boss there, and he said, Oh, I've got a job opening in a few weeks' time. Um, and here I am, <laughs> uh, four years later. Um, so, it, it don't, don't, I don't know. But someone asked, you know, how, you know, how do we network now when there's all Teams and Zooms? Yeah, it's it's that's more, way more challenging. It's yeah. very difficult. So what you're doing now is the right thing, coming to events like this. Um, most of us are, I'll be, will be available by, by email, Twitter, LinkedIn, all those uh, media channels. Yeah. Ask questions, ask advice. You know, if you are looking for bachelor's um, dissertation projects or master's projects, just contact people like us and ask, do you have a project available? Often I design a project for a student if they want to do a master's project with me, if I have the time. But, you know, you never know. Ask. I think exactly the same. It's reaching out to people. And I guess now you've got so many social media channels and so many channels you can talk to people. It is really hard still when you can't speak to someone face to face. It's really hard to go up to someone and like message them because you kind of feel like you're annoying them. But, you know, yeah. everyone that I've spoken to is more than willing to give advice. I There's plenty of people, like my colleagues that have um spoken this week and they were like yeah happy to have anyone contact happy to have a chat and it's, it's that first daunting moment of messaging someone but more than often more often than not they will always message you back and will be happy to talk and give yeah. advice couldn't agree more couldn't just, agree more just, just apologies in advance if it's not immediate response yeah we're definitely not ignoring you if it no. takes a little bit longer to come back but but we always come back <laughs> Um, we, we don't have so long left in our session because it always goes, I, I'm pretty sure the three of us could talk for ages uh, on this topic, but but I think that there's maybe one question, it uh, wasn't raised in the chat, but something that might be interesting for, for those to, who are listening, What what's the future in in the topic area that you work in? What do you see as the future in uh, your career and what you're, what you're doing that might be of interest to the people listening? Uh, Devin, that, do you want, or whoever wants to go yeah, first? I think, mate, yeah. is that for all of us to answer? Is this, okay. Yeah, I think this is just, this is something for all of us to share our experiences. Devin, do you want to go first? Yeah, okay. Um, personally, I feel I'm going to try with the coding, but I'm not sure how far that's going to go. Um, but I, I think for me, it's more probably similar to you Charlotte in the project management kind of thing the customer client facing making the data that is useful for everyone and kind of helping as much as possible um as a GIS in general as GIS in general I do think it's going to go automated I do think it's going to be um yeah I think it's mainly automation but also but it is always going to be client facing and it is always going to be making sure the customer at the end is happy and when you've got um, like you working on oil, oil spills or you're working on hazards, it's going to, especially at the moment, it seems to be we're having a some kind of disaster every couple of yeah. months. And yeah. I think that's probably more social media. We're seeing it a lot more. But yeah, I think with GIS, it's the only way you're going to be able to put that across now is making sure that it's very well documented um, and for example, with La Palma, like showing where the lava flows are and making sure that people can see that and and a lot more communication. I think that's what will come out of GIS as well. Ekbal, awesome. Thanks, Devon, by the way. That's really insightful. <laughs> <laughs> Top of my head. <laughs> so actually, I do think about this a lot, the future of my job and our jobs. And there's a really one answer in my field anyway. It's 
the, the, the global challenges we, we need to work on, the sustainable development goals, the Sendai framework for disaster risk. You know, we have some really, really big challenges in the world we need to work on. And thinking about how our work fits into that is what we really we're concerned about. So whether it's climate change, disaster risk, alleviating poverty, uh, all those challenges that on a global level we need to work on. And thinking about how the geosciences in general fits into all that is something that's, you know, we, we need to think about. Um, and additionally, and for the remote sensing side, the number of satellites that are going up each year is, is, is growing. It's, I think I still remember there's like 3,000 satellites now in remote, of which are nearly 1,000 are remote sensing. And that number is only going to go up. And so, you know, it's just think about this huge, huge volumes of data that are coming down from these satellites is how in the world do you think about pulling information out of them? And that links to Devon's, you know, we, it's going to be about algorithms and development of, of codes, machine learning, AI, all those things that's the real future, I think. Maybe not in the, maybe not in the next year or two, but certainly in the next decade, um, it's going to change. And think about how smart ways of interpreting information interpreting data yeah i couldn't agree more that exactly what i was going to say as well to be honest i think the um you know the, the virtue of, of working in the in the space industry is is fantastic because it's changing all the time um and it's always really exciting to see all the new technology that's going up some of which is like continuity of missions that have been running for you know 50 plus years so thinking of landsat um and then there are you know new missions that are bringing about kind of new ways to, to, uh, to, to generate data, onboard processing of data. So we're then receiving data that's, that's ready to use in a very different way or being served data through a platform in a very different way than we, we are used to as remote sensors. Um, so I think that for me is like where the future goes is, 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 is automation, um, this range of new technology and so much more information, if that is even possible, it kind of doesn't feel like it would be possible because there's so much out there. But there's so much, as, as Ekbal said, I think there's more satellites being launched in the coming years and has been launched in the entire history of uh, satellite exploration for Earth observation. So it's it's an, an insane amount of information that's going to become available and how we how we in our industries can make the most of that and and for our clients to be able to benefit from that is something that will be a big part of our futures so um yeah i think we're probably to time becky but uh we could probably stay and chat all afternoon if we were allowed <laughs> i know we could do a whole day on this it, it's been really interesting um so thank you so much um for your wonderful presentations um i hope um everyone's a little more enlightened now um so um moving on to the final session of the day and the final session of the whole three-day program um we've got a really useful session on kind of um further careers in geoscience so um things that you wouldn't kind of typically consider um i've got three wonderful panelists um all from different backgrounds so i've got emma liam and ruben who are all on the call now um, and I believe Emma's going to kind of kick off first um, with a presentation to introduce herself. Um, so thanks, Emma, and sorry about the dog barking. Um, thanks, all. <laughs> thanks, everyone. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Over to you, Emma. <laughs> so hi, everyone, and uh, welcome. And um, I guess, yeah, you saved uh, the best to last um, for uh, our session here. So, um, just put together a, um, a few slides, a little bit um, about myself. So um, my name's Emma Bernard and I'm the curator of Fossil Fish at the Natural History Museum in London. And I've been working for, um, there for just over 10 years now. And uh, so I'll tell you a little bit about my job in just a second, but I thought I would quickly tell you a little bit about actually how I got there. How did I actually um, get to that job? Uh, basically from a very young age, I knew I always wanted to study and work in paleontology. Um, I guess I never really kind of grew out of that dinosaur phase that a lot of kids have when they're younger. And uh, so I was always fascinated by fossils and animals which lived hundreds of millions of years ago and that aren't around today. So I knew that um, when I went to university that I couldn't do an undergraduate degree in paleontology, um, although there are a few different options uh, 
um, available today. So I thought it would probably be best to do a degree in uh, geology and try and get a better understanding um, of the sector and to also potentially have something uh, to fall back on in case my dreams of dinosaur hunting uh, never materialised. Um, it was whilst I was at the um, Glasgow University doing my undergraduates, um, I had the opportunity of doing a research project at the Hunterian Museum, which was part of uh, Glasgow University. And that was the first time that I'd ever been behind the scenes in a museum and um, saw so much uh, stuff, basically. And I got to work with a lot of the curators there. And I was absolutely amazed at, um, you know, what they were doing and um, all these different specimens, you know, so all the things that you never get to see when you just go and visit at a museum exhibition. So I thought that was um, pretty cool. Um, following on from my undergraduate, I knew that, as I said, I wanted to do something in paleontology. So I then went on to do a master's in paleobiology at the University of Bristol. And to um, sort of gain extra experience and just try and help um, build up my CV. Um, I started volunteering um, at Bristol Museum, which was actually just next door to the uh, our sciences department at Bristol. Um, and again, I, I was getting more involved with the collections and, um, you know, working with different researchers. Um, and I found that side really, really interesting. Um, but when I first started at Bristol, I thought I would probably move on to do a PhD after I finished my master's. However, I soon realised once I started at Bristol um, that actually doing a PhD wasn't for me. And um, I really wanted to pursue working in the museum sector. So I continued volunteering after I graduated um, alongside working in a call centre, actually, because I had to uh, pay the bills somehow. Um, and after about a year, um, unfortunately, I didn't get any museum job offers. So I decided to go back and do another master's in museum studies just to kind of gain a bit more experience and um, also some additional qualifications. Whilst there, I did a work placement at Worcester City Museum. So again, I was getting more experience working on actually biology and more recent uh, collections rather than just fossils and rocks. And so that was just kind of like helping uh, bulk out my CV and gain different experiences. Um, following on from that, just after I left Leicester, I got offered my first job at the, um, the Yorkshire uh, Museum. And so I started working there on a variety of different projects and it was a fantastic opportunity because that was actually when um, they had closed the museum and they were doing a massive refurbishment on the, in the galleries. So I got gained a, a huge amount of knowledge and expertise uh, there. Unfortunately, this was a series of uh, short term uh, contracts, which is quite typical in the museum sector when you're just uh, starting out. Um, but it did lead me and help me gain my uh, first permanent job um, at the Natural History Museum just over 10 years ago. Um, so I thought I would put together a slide of like lots of different pictures, basically summarising uh, what my job um, actually involves. So apart from wearing a lot of pink and posing with um, the occasional fossil, um, as a curator, I'm specifically responsible for about 100,000 fossil fish, ranging in size from a uh, sub millimeter up to some specimens that are over six meters in length. Uh, they date back to nearly 450 million years ago, more or less up to uh, present day. So as a curator, I'm responsible for caring and conserving those collections. So I need to know what they are, where they came from, how old they are, and how the museum actually acquired them. So I typically host about 200 scientific visitors from all around the world that come to the museum collections each year, apart from uh, during the last uh, sort of 18 months or so. But they can be looking at anything from uh, past climates, uh, they found a new fossil, they think it might be a new species, so they need to compare and look at other collections. And um, to actually maybe how an entire group of fossil fish might have um, become extinct uh, 400 million years ago. Um, other parts of my job are working on exhibitions, both inside the museum and around the world. Um, one part of the job that I really love doing actually is outreach. So alongside the exhibitions, that can also involve me uh, speaking at schools and supervising uh, students, uh, working on different projects in the collections and working in different uh, science festivals um, around the country. And that's a real buzz when you're speaking to um, you know, whatever, whoever it is that you're speaking to, whether it be schools um, or a family or even somebody who is uh, 80 years old and they're just interested in finding out a bit more. And when you sort of tell them a little bit about the knowledge or about some of these fossils and they're so grateful and actually that's a real buzz uh, for me. I think one of the 
major highlights of my job is I actually get to travel the world and dig up fossils for a living. So I'm currently living my uh, five-year-old uh, dream. Uh, so I've got to travel to some really exciting places in Morocco, America, Australia, uh, France, Germany, and other parts um, throughout the UK. Um, so that's um, a real highlight of the, the job. So I'm going out there, we're looking at um, looking for fossils and knowing that you're the first person to ever come across and see that, that fossil is actually something really special. And that um, gives me um, a real buzz. Um, I'll be honest, there are parts of my job where I just uh, I'm spending um, lots of time in meetings and emails. However, because I work with such fantastic collections, if I'm having a bit of a bad day, I just go outside in the museum and I get to handle some amazing fossils uh, collected by some fantastic people, um, sometimes hundreds um, of years ago. The last part of my job is um, involving research. So um, I specifically look at microvertebrate remains from the Jurassic um, of England, so about um, oh, nearly 200 million years ago, and how did they, um, all these different animals interact. And another part that I do is, um, alongside some other colleagues inside the museum, um, are looking at past uh, climates. So specifically, I work on fossil sharks, and how did they respond to periods of intense global warming, and then also intense global cooling, and then how that might have shifted um, over the last 100 million years and how we can maybe use that to help predict uh, what might happen um, to the future and in our oceans. Um, so there's lots of different careers uh, in the museum sector. So I've said lots of stuff about um, curators um, and collection management staff. But there's other people who um, actually work doing the conservation and the preparation of a lot of these uh, fossils that we're finding. Um, so they're fantastic people. Um, spend lots of time normally like sort of like um, drills and um, grinding away a lot of the uh, fossil and a lot of the matrix surrounding the fossils and um, there's educators we've got fantastic outreach department so I think any museum is involved with sometimes even like babies coming into the museum all the way up to uh, people and 90 100 years old even and just trying to engage them and inspire um, them to, um, to care about the natural world um, as well. Um, so there's lots of different uh, career paths. I don't think there's necessarily a specific route to get into uh, the museum sector, but what I would say is that it definitely helps if you have a little bit of experience, whether that be through doing voluntary work um, or getting involved um, in your local uh, museum group or geology group in the area and getting hands-on with collections. I think that um, definitely helps. So I'm very happy for people to contact me if you've got any uh, questions or any advice about working um, in museums. Um, I've, as I said, I've either volunteered or worked in sort of small, local, large, regional, and now um, a large national, international museum. Um, doing a little bit of a plug for the Geological Curators Group that I'm part of, and we've put together um, a booklet about people amassing their own geological collections, and that includes people doing undergraduate projects, uh, masters and PhD projects, where they're actually going to be start collecting um, and amassing their own collections for their research. So um, if you'd like to check that out, uh, please, um, please go ahead. Um, I do have a LinkedIn page, but I'm not so good at um, keeping on board with that. But I've got my email address there and I'm on Twitter at NHM Fossil Fish. So I'm um, very happy for you guys uh, to get in touch. So um, stop sharing that there. And um, I'm delighted to be joined by both Liam and uh, Ruben uh, for the session this afternoon. So I am believing I'm passing over to Liam. Thanks, Emma. Um, yeah, I'll, uh, I'll try and share screen now and do something similar. So um, let's see if, uh, if this, this does the job right. So yeah, I'm, I'm Liam Herringshaw. Uh, I am uh, I'm a paleontologist, like Emma really. I, I study fossils as well. Uh, and in fact, funny if we have overlaps with the fact that I'm based in York, where the Yorkshire Museum is, and I'm from Leicester, where she did her master. So there you go, all, all, it all links together. <laughs> but yeah, so I'm now a paleontologist with a company called Hidden Horizons, who are based in Scarborough uh, on the Yorkshire coast. Uh, so I work with, with them on various fronts, which I'll explain in a moment. Uh, I'm also now the director of the Yorkshire Fossil Festival, which is uh, a sort of annual um, fossil festival event, so sort of the earth science event, which um, has taken place for a few years, didn't happen in, uh, in 2020 for obvious reasons, but uh, uh, we brought it back again. This year, 
Uh, and I'll explain a little bit how kind of I got here, I suppose. Um, my degree was in geology and physical geography at Liverpool. Um, so I didn't, at that time, I guess I didn't really, I didn't really know I could be a paleontologist, but um, I, I was interested in earth science, probably in a, in a you know, fairly broad way. So geology, physical geography, that sort of thing. And I, I just thought, I'll you know, see how that goes. And I, I, I enjoyed the, the sort of, um, the, the sedimentary and, uh, and, and fossil kind of side of that. So I ended up doing a, a PhD at, in, in Birmingham. Um, which is a kind of museum PhD as well. So again, there's a bit of overlap with some of the things that, that Emma's talked about. Um, now, uh, as of the last sort of year or so, uh, I'm, I've kind of gone into a rather different direction, I suppose. So Hidden Horizons uh, as a company has been in existence for about eight years. And uh, I say it's based at, in Scarborough. In fact, you can come to the fossil shop now in Scarborough. That's, that's now our headquarters. We've had it for about a year. Um, and Will, who, who runs Hidden Horizons, uh, has a geology degree originally as well. He worked in museums for many years, um, but he set up Hidden Horizons to, to really work with schools and the public to, uh, to kind of engage them with, with fossils and earth science, but actually other things as well. So actually, at the moment, Hidden Horizons runs stargazing events. It runs uh, forest school uh, events. We do lots of sort of outreach for people. We do consultancy. So sometimes we'll work with companies or, or, or museums actually to do things with, with them on particular projects. Um, and, uh, and so yeah, I help there with particularly with fossil kind of things, but uh, but other other projects as well. And alongside that, so I, I kind of work, I suppose, four days a week for, for Hidden Horizons and a day a week uh, on the Yorkshire Fossil Festival. So that means I'm 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 contracted by Scarborough Museums Trust to to run the, the fossil festival in scarborough i did it last month and uh, and so i'm kind of you know calming down after <laughs> after a, a fairly busy few weeks uh, and then we'll do it again next september um and and that's it doesn't have to be in scarborough we've done it in in hull in the past and we'll hope to move it around yorkshire in, in the future but it has tended to be in in scarborough in the, in the, the few years that it has run um and that again is to try and engage people with rocks and fossils and landscapes and the earth and, and you know, look for different ways that we could perhaps inspire people to, to look more closely. Uh, and you'll see, uh, I guess, a little flag to the Fossil Film Fest. This, this year we decided we would take the festival into perhaps a more traditional festival direction and, and have some, uh, some events that were um, on the big screen. And, uh, and we had the, the local theatre, the Stephen Joseph Theatre in Scarborough screening fossil film. So we have obviously had Jurassic Park, but we, we had some other slightly less obvious choices, uh, including um, uh, a film called The Valley of Guanji from the 1960s, which is actually the last film by an animator called Ray Harryhausen, who's very famous as a, as, as a brilliant sort of developer of animation. Uh, but he was really good at, at the early animation of, of dinosaurs and Steven Spielberg was actually inspired by this. And we had a, a paleo artist who came along and, and talked about the influence of of Harryhausen on art and in fact more generally about you know, how people, how artists have imagined uh, past and lost life. Um, so that was a really interesting thing to consider because actually you, know, you can bring a lot of different skills into uh, fossils and earth science so there's something for everyone if, essentially you know you, you could come at it from all sorts of different directions. Um, this is a slightly less exciting looking slide so I won't spend a lot of time <laughs> here but really in terms of what we're doing at the moment say Hidden Horizons we do a lot of fossil hunting trips we take families and schools out on the coast around Yorkshire looking for fossils and explain you know, how we find them and, and what to look for we do a lot of dinosaur footprint walks around the Yorkshire coast because we have have them in I won't say abundance but they're pretty common um, and then schools workshops uh, we have a project called uh, Stratum Young we're trying to persuade kids to to get into geology earlier um, and, and going out to schools and working with them. We have also, I live in York, I do some walks in and around York where we try and explore the, the sort of the geology, the landscape and, and the hidden history of York. So those are quite a new thing that we've, we've added. Um, I'm also now doing, probably partly because of COVID, a lot of online classes. So in the autumn, winter months, we've been we're offering um, online paleontology classes that you can sign up for. And because the fossil shop actually has a replica fossil making business as well called GeoEd, we can send people replica fossil sets to use in the class so it's it's a bit like a, a mini open university because that's how the open university used to used to work they would send people out rocks and fossils and, and we kind of do that on a very small scale now um, and as i say we do other things uh, with museum education uh, groups and a little bit of research uh, some of the things that emma's kind of mentioned and then uh, i guess a little bit of, of media engagement often people want to come to the yorkshire coast and find out a bit more and so we sometimes get asked to you know, explain that and um, yeah the yorkshire fossil festival will come back to 
uh, to Scarborough next year, 16th to 18th of September. So although it's nearly a year away, we're planning already for what that will look like, because hopefully we'll be more in person than we were able to this year. And we're looking really to have a much bigger education day on the Friday of the festival. So schools events and online workshops and careers events, and hopefully a, a symposium, a kind of a little mini conference organized by students. So um, that's that's work in progress, but that's, that's kind of the, the plan. Um, the Fossil Festival website at the moment is mostly stuff from this year, but we're in the process of updating it for next year. And one of the things we are putting up at the moment on our new YouTube channel is the videos from this year's festival. Um, so you can go and sort of hear some of the talks that people gave and, and, and see some of the videos that we that we got produced. Um, so yeah, hopefully the, the festival will be something that we, we can run with for many years, uh, but there's certainly lots of different things going on on the coast and it's really interesting to be now kind of part of this, um, this sort of project or these projects. Uh, and yeah, how did I get here? Well, uh, complicated, so <laughs> I won't try and run through all of it, but I've done lots of things um, to get here. I, I've basically, most of the last, last 15 years, been working in, in universities, um, but up until uh, up until 2015, it was all very short term contracts, typically. So I moved around quite a lot. I was in Canada for a while, in Scotland for a while, uh, in Birmingham for a while. I worked in office in Leicester for a year trying to work out what I was going to do. Um, and, and then I got eventually a, a lecture, lecturer position in, in Hull. So the last five years, 2015, 2020, I was a lecturer in geology at the University of Hull. And then I decided that I was going to take a different direction. And so I, uh, I, I quit <laughs> and I've, uh, I've gone into this, uh, this rather new route um and uh and yeah it's been a really interesting and enjoyable uh, if slightly uncertain year or so um and yeah you can you can find a bit more about what i'm up to on on twitter and, uh, and instagram if you uh, if you're interested in that sort of thing my subject skills are really fossils and, and sedimentary rocks i've learned quite a lot of transferable skills i suppose over the years and and you know lots of sort of presentation type i wasn't very good at giving talks when i was a student and i've, I've done it so much now that i've got a lot happier with it and people say how do you do that well practice really um but also things like uh, you know project management teamwork fundraising all these things that perhaps i never thought of having to do i've found myself learning and and getting better at, I wouldn't say I'm good at all of them, but uh, I've, I've got better at them. So yeah, you'll find that that skills can be both subject specific and quite quite general and transferable. So we can pick up some more of that, I'm sure, uh, later in the discussion. So I will hand over now, I think, to uh, to Ruben. Hello, folks. Hi, uh, I'm going to see if I can... Um, <laughs> First of all, have, thank you for having me here. I'm going to see if I can share my screen. Give us a thumbs up if this works, please. Are you seeing that? Not yet. Oh no. I don't worry, we had this earlier. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, uh, do you want to email me the presentation I can share? I, I did try earlier and um, it got rejected, Becky, by your server. Oh, sorry, yeah, I yeah. did see. Um, um, I'll message you another email address in the chat one minute. All right, okay. Talk amongst yourselves, folks. I'll just see if I can um, send this to you so that you can share it on my behalf, Becky, please. Yeah, so if there's anybody in the audience that's watching this just now, if you want to put any of your questions um, into the chats um, from any, you know, any sort of questions you might have about going into museums, um, working in universities, um, why we chose our um, career paths, you know, what a typical day even involves, because um, I would have to say there's probably not a typical day as such. Always expect the unexpected, I think. Um, but yeah, so do feel free to put any uh, comments or questions um, in the chat as well. And uh, yeah, hopefully we'll be able to uh, bring you Ruben's presentation. Yeah, I say I, I, I could talk about lots of different bits that have kind of led me to where, I, where I've got. But uh, I guess like, like Emma says, you often end up doing quite a few different things and, and you don't quite always know where it's going to um, end up so uh, so yes there's not really for where, certainly where I've got I don't think there's a single way you you must do it. Um, it it's kind of worked out in a probably a fairly roundabout way at times of you know, getting to where I am now so um, yeah, yeah. I, I think I feel like you couldn't repeat what I, I wouldn't suggest you repeat what, <laughs> what, I, what I've done exactly yeah I, I completely drifted into teaching and uh, as I'd, I'd like to be able to show you in a, in a minute or so, uh, I'm just waiting to see if I can get a, a different email address uh, from Becky. But um, oh, yeah, it's, it's, it's funny how, sorry. I've messaged you in the chat. All ah, right, okay. Sorry. 
All right, okay, sorry. I'll try that. Here we go. Here we go. We're all now waiting. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Don't say anything else in case... Uh, in case we, uh, we we had this in the uh, um, session just before um exactly the same thing screen share and it just did not come up so um it's you're not the only one today no, I, I think keep on looking over here because i've got two screens on the go so right here it comes becky i hope ah, excellent has that arrived um, no, I'll give it a few seconds because sometimes with an attachment it takes slightly longer. So yeah, it's quite nice of being involved in a day like today actually, and just hearing people's different um, paths to the um, where they ended up in. You know, the I think the one thing um, you know because I listened to a few of the other sessions, it's not necessarily a straight path or smooth. I think we've all had like little bumps in our career and had to go through. Uh, some uh, difficult times sometimes, you know, like being unemployed or, you know, just trying to get different jobs and finding out exactly what you love to do. And um, so I think today's been a really great session and hearing a lot more about that. Yeah, I mean, I, I worked as when I was at the University of Hull, I became the director of admissions. So I, you know, I was in charge of the geography, geology, environment so departments admissions thing. And I would say to people who are thinking of studying at university, that one thing I've realized is there's always more time than you think. And I know that's a geological kind of joke because there's obviously huge amounts of time, but, but actually you, know, you, you don't, your decision at one point in time does not then mean you can never get off that path or never you know, follow something else. And I think I've realized that sometimes you do things that you thought were the right thing and actually turn out later on, maybe they weren't, but, but there is always more time available to kind of change into a slightly different direction. It's not all terrible pun again, set in stone. So, you know, it's, I think, I think that's an important thing to get across really is, you can travel in different directions and, and end up somewhere, totally. yeah. somewhere that totally. makes you happy. So, yeah, I think we're we're nearly there. I think uh, I think Becky's now opening it. <laughs> we, we need some uh, we need some sort of tension music or yeah. uh, a little bit of uh, countdown. Right, uh... always wanted to do this. Hello, Wembley. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I'm ready. Um, right. Yeah. Thank you, Becky. Thanks for saving uh, the day. Screen. Uh, it's okay. Um, <laughs> bit of an overstatement there. Um, right. <laughs> I'll take that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, so, so see if you can start it and, and I'll just keep saying next slide. So next slide, please. All right. So that's what it is. This is going to be an advert for teaching. This is what I drifted into and I've absolutely loved. Next slide, please. So my name's Ruben. Um, I'm currently teaching geology and environmental science at A-level, and I also coordinate EPQ, which might be a new qualification for some of you. It's extended project qualification. It's worth half an A-level, and it's just a project that is really popular now in six forms. I work at East Norfolk Sixth Form College in Norfolk, um, and a long, long time ago, I went to Oxford Poly. Next slide, please. There you go, so there's a photo from, or a couple of photos from the time. Don't look, let's go on to the next slide, please. And it's much the same now, it's just Oxford Books, but um, there you go, it's turned into color now. Next slide, please, that's right. So um, uh, there you go, so that's just a, a, an aerial shot of where I work at the moment. It's a sixth form, um, I think we've got about 1600 students on roll. So it's a nice size, 16 to 19 year olds. Next slide, please. Uh, okay, so this is all about um, time and work-life balance and so on. So it says there, our timetable has three lessons each day. It's different everywhere you go, but um, where I work, we have three lessons each day. Each lasts an hour and a half, and there's also time built in for planning and preparation and meetings and marking. So if we have a look at the next slide, this is um, the latest iteration of my timetable. So I mean that about quarter past eight in the mornings, I'm actually paid to be in from quarter to nine. And then um, the teaching finishes at three. We have a half an hour session after that for students to drop in in case they need any help. We're paid for that. And um, twice a week, I'm paid to stay until four o'clock for meetings. Okay, that's, that's my timetable. Next slide, please. So this is the important bit. This is called directed time. All teachers on a standard contract are paid for 1,265 hours a year. 
uh, spread over up to 195 days. And what I find is it does give me brilliant work-life balance. Next slide, please. So uh, here's just comparing teaching with working offshore on a two weeks on, two weeks off shift pattern or offshore on a two weeks on, three weeks off pattern or just uh, a standard um, UK um, sort of standard job minimum um, 35 hours a week, 28 days a year, plus some, um, you know, in, including all of the uh, bank holidays and so on. So blue means how much, how many days you're free per year. And sorry, yeah, blue is how many days you work each year and, and orange is how much you are free each year. So you can see that teaching's not that incomparable with working offshore and certainly seems to be um, um, a lot better, or a lot more free time compared to a standard sort of working job in terms of days per year. Te people always go on about teachers and how many holidays we get. Well, that is one of the attractions of the job. Next slide, please. And if you look at how many hours we're actually contracted to work a year, so teaching um, looks better now than offshore. Um, with offshore, of course, you're trapped because even if you're um, if you're there for say two weeks and you're working 12 hour shifts, you can't really do a lot that, that you might want to do in the 12 hours that you're not on shift. You know, you, you, you'll have a gym and a cinema and a room to go to and so on, but you, it is trapped time. So that's why I put in the the trapped wedges in the middle two pies. Um, but um, it's you can see it compares fairly well with with someone who's just working as standard. But then they might want to do overtime as well on top of that. So so the hours per year aren't too bad. Next slide, please. And pay. So it's a bit hard to see the numbers on this. Um, all of the um, graphs show the uh, show from naught up to one hundred and forty thousand pounds per year. So you can see that teaching salaries for um, you know, sorry, starting salaries in teaching um, are in the low 20s. Offshore tends to be a bit higher. Um, uh, statutory minimum, 30, 35 hour week tends to be around about the same. Average teaching salary around about 40,000. Offshore tends to be a bit better. Statutory is a little bit lower. And the sky's the limit really with any sort of job, isn't it? Um, if you're prepared to move into management, you can earn up to about 120,000 a year in teaching as you can in, in other jobs as well. Next slide, please. So what's good about it? I enjoy it. I really, really love teaching. I've done it for years now, and I just get the same buzz from it now as I always have done. Um, I get to discuss my passion for my subject. I get to try and pass that on to new, new students every, every year. I get to keep on learning about geology and associated things. I get to try and um, inspire the next generation. We, we really need more geologists. Nationally, uh, the, the, the um, number of, of um, people who are going on to um, geoscience graduate uh, undergraduate courses is dropping year on year. There's a real crisis. And so by trying to feed some students in who've had experience of it at A level means that uh, I'm hopefully doing my little bit to, to uh, help to make sure we've got enough geoscientists in the future. Next slide, please. So it's not all about field work. When I was a student and before that, when I did geology at school myself, um, it was the field work that I loved most of all. Unfortunately, we don't do loads and loads and loads of field work. Um, on the, I, I follow the OCR exam board, um, A-level syllabus, and uh, that requires four days of field work throughout the whole of the A-level. But because of um, funding, because um, you're asking parents, usually the ones who have to cough up for this, I try and make field work as inclusive as possible. So we don't go away for long residential trips. I could offer them, but I know that I wouldn't get all my students doing it. So, so it's not all about field work, I'm afraid. Next slide, please. So let's have a quick look at how I got to here. So I graduated in 1986. I really didn't know what to do next. As a, I think a lot of the panelists today have been like that, but I did know that I enjoyed being outside. So next slide. There you go. So some pictures of me enjoying being outdoors. Um, the one on the left that does show a, a uh, Liz Withington walking in the water there, if anyone knows Liz. Next slide, please. So I started volunteering after I finished my degree, just started volunteering with my local county wildlife trust in Suffolk. Next slide, please. And that was good. It, um, it taught me some different skills and um, it was nice to have a break from being in lectures and so on. But um, 
Next slide, please. I then decided to go back and just be a student for another year, really. I think that was that was the truth of it. I quite wanted to just be another student. And doing a PGCE, a postgraduate certificate in education, was a route into doing that. Now, really important point to think about. If you're a geologist, do you go and train to do geography or science? Um, and uh, I chose geography, and it's been very good for me, but I do realise that I probably would have been promoted earlier if I'd gone in as science, because there's a shortage of science teachers, and it's all about market economics. If there's a if there's a shortage, then you tend to you're able to move around more. You've got more marketable skills. Next slide, please. So my first school was in Wantage in Oxfordshire. That's where I um, took part in teacher training. They offered me a job when I'd finished the year, so I worked there for a little while. Next slide. It's just showing where Wantage is. Next slide, please. Then I moved to Lowestoft, next slide please, on the East Coast, and I was, um, I was there for, oh, I thought I was going to go there for a year, I ended up being there 18 years because it was so great. Um, I, uh, at both of those schools, Wantage and, Low, and in Lowestoft, I um, was primarily a, a geography teacher, but in both places I was able to introduce geology as a new subject. And, uh, and get some students into that. Uh, at Lowestoft, I also got involved in teacher training, both with the UEA and also through something called the Graduate Teacher Program. That's what those yellow dots are. Next slide, please. And then um, a few years ago, I moved here to work in a sixth form. So I've done mostly geology and environmental science. Um, a couple of years I've taught exclusively geology, but usually there's a bit of other stuff on the timetable and environmental science is a nice complementary subject. Uh, I've also been in management for a while, and um, I've also taught the EPQ. Next slide, please. So what I would suggest is, if you are not quite sure what to do next, and you're thinking, what shall I do with my degree? I would say, try it. Find somewhere local, just get, contact a school, make sure that you're talking to the right person. Um, um, you know, so ask, uh, who, who should I speak to about um, just trying teaching as a career? Um, you might find that you could go straight in and uh, without any teaching qualification, you could get employed because QTS, Qualified Teacher Status, isn't actually needed to work as a teacher in an academy or an independent school or a free school. You will often find that you'll get paid on a different pay, school if you, pay scale if you have got QTS, though. There's a lot of different schemes available that will allow you to get QTS. And the first decision to make is what sort of age range would you be interested in teaching? Once you've got QTS, you can still switch. Um, there's nothing stopping you from being primary qualified and then moving into secondary or vice versa. Next slide, please. Check your qualifications. If you do want to go on to one of the training schemes, then you'll need a degree. Uh, for some of them, it needs to be at least a 2-1, but not all, always. Um, you'll need a GCSE grade four, which in old money is uh, a C grade in English and maths. And if you want to be a primary school teacher, you'll need science as well. Next slide, please. There's um, a, uh, a, a funding calculator there to find out how much you could actually get um, for funding towards your, the cost of doing the training. There's a big range out there, which is why it's worth doing your homework first. Next slide, please. So for instance, if you say, oh, I'll be a biologist, well, you'll find that you'll get a 7,000 pound bursary and you'll get um, loans for tuition fee and maintenance. Next slide. Chemistry, physics, maths at the moment, you'll get a £24,000 bursary, which is much nicer, isn't it? Um, there's also a scholarship of £26,000. And, uh, and of course, you're able to tap into tuition fees and maintenance loans. Whereas, next slide, please. For all geographers, there's plenty of geographers. Uh, the joke in schools is that anyone can teach geography, which isn't true, but um, you often find that um, PE teachers, once their knees have gone, they try and get themselves into geography departments. So geography, there's no bursary because there's, there's, there's an adequate number of geography teachers at the moment, but you can still apply for the tuition fee and maintenance loans. Next slide, please. So find the right training. Next slide. There's a range of options if you do want to get trained. Um, you could go via the traditional university route, a PGCE, that will include getting qualified teacher status. You can also use a scheme called School Direct, which has got two versions of it. You can have your fee funded, or you can be salaried by the teacher, uh, sorry, by the school, I beg your pardon. 
There's also a scheme called Teach First, which is also salaried. So there's, there's, it's a real jungle out there at the moment and um, lots of different routes into teaching. Um, and as I said earlier, you don't even necessarily need to have a qualification, although I think that getting trained is a good thing to do. It means that you, um, you paddle before you swim. You don't just jump straight in the deep end. Next slide, please. A couple of other options. You could think of um, trying uh, just, just having a little go at working in education by working in a PGL centre or for the Field Studies Council. Um, if you look on their websites, you'll find that they, they will advertise where they've got vacancies. And quite often they're keen on taking just young, um, uh, keen graduates um, rather than being too worried about someone actually having a teaching qualification. And there's quite a few people will move into teaching because they've really enjoyed working for one of these employers. Other, other employers are available. Next slide, please. Okay, so those are my contact details. I know I've sort of gabbled on a bit, but um, I'm, I'm there on LinkedIn, so I'm more than happy for you to contact me if, you, uh, if, if you're interested in finding out more about this. Just look on LinkedIn. I think there's just one more slide. There you go. That's where I got the information yesterday about salaries. That's all of them. Thank you. Apologies that the uh, I couldn't I didn't have primary control over the PowerPoints. Thank you, Becky, for sorting that. Super. No, it was a great presentation. I'm glad we got there um, in the end. So thanks for that. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Thanks for that. So um, yeah, if anybody um, has got any questions, just pop them in the chat. And um, I'm sure we'll be very happy to uh, answer some of them. Um, but I thought maybe we might just start off with um, a few sort of like just general questions. Um, you know, what sort of things do we all like about our chosen fields? And then maybe um, slightly controversial, maybe some of the things that you don't quite like about your chosen fields. Because I think um, with any <laughs> job, I think I, I, when I always talk to people, I always like to try and be completely honest and transparent. There's, you're going to have some really great and um, fun opportunities but also equally you know with all of that good there are some you know downsides to things so um yeah Liam maybe start with yourself yeah um I, I mean I guess what do I, I like my job now it, it's it's so varied again you know so many different things you end up doing um and I guess I get to do a lot of sort of paleontological things and geological things that I that I like doing you know whether it's talking to school groups or or anybody really um so that's that's really a big part of what, what I enjoy, the variety and, and the chance to you know, focus on the things that I really love doing. But I guess that the, the counterbalance that is it is the uncertainty. So, you know, I worked for quite a few years, so the last five years, I had a, you know, a, essentially a permanent job in a university. I couldn't always do the things I wanted to do, but I had a, you know, had the stability and I've now kind of swapped that round in that sense, I have a sort of control over my own uh, destiny but it does mean at times you know well, what am I doing next am I being paid for this does this you know so it, yeah I guess you have to decide and I think I've probably got old enough that I worry a little less about that and I think probably that was part of the reason I was able to you know to, to move almost was was that I felt okay and I'm, I'm happy to take this challenge um, but but yes it is at times you're almost self-funding in a way you're trying to find ways of bringing in things that will pay you and, and not everything does so so yeah that's that's the difficult part I suppose of what I do at the moment. Yeah Ruben what about yourself? Yeah yeah um so I've got a job that it doesn't pay the top but um it pays enough for me to be comfortable I've got a good pension scheme um I've got plenty of holidays um the things that I that that have been challenges in the past in education I've, I've sort of learned how to work smart to avoid them so um uh, if everyone is worried about um, discipline. If, if you're going to become a teacher, or you know, are, are there going to be problems with, with discipline? And uh, you soon learn whether how to how to have your own strategies to deal with that, and whether it's going to get to you or not. So, so uh, some people put school problems in a box and walk away from it when they go home. Some people just develop very thick skin or whatever. Um, uh, I, I've, I've sort of learned over the year, or when I was working in schools, I learned to try and use humour as much as possible to to uh, defuse uh, situations so that you just get students actually wanted to just come and be not necessarily entertained. I'm not saying I did puppet shows in my lessons, but, um, you know, so that it would be that they would they would not hate turning up for my lessons. Um, 
yeah, so so that's that's one big thing. Um, and of course, you don't get that as a problem if you work in a sixth form, which has been brilliant anyway for the last since two thousand and eight. Now I've been here, so students are here because they want to be here. And the other big thing that is that you do see pe people leaving the profession over is the workload due to marking, and that is just something where yeah, sometimes you just have to suck it up when there's a load of coursework has to be done. But I think if you if you're crafty about how you do it and you um, there's all sorts of things nowadays that as a, as a new new teacher, if you're on a training course, you will be taught how to do these things. You don't have to you don't have to take all, all the marking home yourself. You can do peer marking and online marking, all sorts of things nowadays that mean that you're not just going home every night and, you know, sitting there with a with a pile of paperwork to have to plow through because that is just soul destroying. And I, I don't think I would have stayed in education if I, if that was still what I was having to do. That was what I did in the early days. But luckily, I was shown how to avoid it and and um, and work better than that. Yeah, no, I was just going to say, um, as I said, I absolutely love my job. Um, I think I've got the best job in the world. i um, very <laughs> privileged to be able to do that and um, getting to work with um, some of the world's leading scientists all around the world. So that was one of the reasons why I didn't want to do a PhD. I, I thought I would have that, you know, stereotypical, you know, undergraduate, master's, PhD, postdoc. Um, but when I got to do my master's, I realised that actually a PhD wasn't for me. I enjoyed learning a little about a yeah. lot. Yeah. And then working as a curator in museums, I get to do that, you know, every day. I'm always learning something new. So I think that's a, that's a really great and good bonus part um, about the job. Um, but yeah, as I said, you know, there's some difficulties about it. Definitely getting in, there's not very many museum jobs around. Sometimes you've got to be a bit crafty. And, you know, maybe coming from the side doing um, so I, like volunteering, for example, um, or doing like outreach and education specifically and then getting, you know, in the museum sector that way. Being very honest, a lot of the starting salaries are quite low. Mm. Um, but if you can stick it out, um, it, you know, it, it, can, it does it does uh, go up. And I always say, um, you know, I love my job. I don't go to work going, Ugh, you know, like, oh, yeah, okay, fine. Um, but I, I love what I do and I love the, my, my colleagues and stuff. And I think because you, you spend so much of your time at work, I think that's actually often more important than um, your, your salary. Because some of my colleagues, um, so friends from university, they went off into industry because they, um, you know, more attractive salaries, for example, um, very quickly realised that that actually wasn't for them which isn't a problem because I think you've definitely got to um, choose those things and then they've gone on to um, other careers as well. So it's um, lots of different things to sort of try and take on board um, there as well. And um, we've got a question that has come in. Um, it's actually addressed to uh, Ruben. So it's uh, due to the reduced number of applicants to undergraduate geology degrees, has this been reflected in the availability of geology, GCSE or A-level courses? Um, I, I'm not sure which come. I'm not sure. I think there's a chicken and egg situation partly going on there. I don't know. Um, a few years ago, uh, here we go, political time, Michael Gove introduced uh, some A-level reforms and um, A-level geology almost died at the time. So did environmental science. And there was a bit of a campaign to save both of those A-levels. Um, but uh, the, the, um, the, syllabus that replaced the outgoing one um, is generally with, with the A-level geology teachers that I'm in touch with is not as well liked as the previous one. You've also got to think that there's a lot of people are about my age or older so we're coming up for retirement anyway, couldn't be bothered with the hassle of learning a new syllabus, different way of doing internal assessment and so on. So I think a lot of people just thought well you know especially if they're doing mostly uh, geography and maybe just a one block of geology they just dropped it. So, so a lot of schools and colleges that used to be teaching it just a few years ago are no longer doing it. Um, plus, there's something else going on anyway, you know, because um, universities recruit from a, a lot of their geoscience undergraduates from, from people who've never had an, an opportunity to do it at A-level anyway. And yet numbers are going down anyway. So, so I'm not quite sure what's going on. Is it because people think that um, uh, geology is all about oil and gas and that's a that's a dying vehicle to get on and so and so you know do something different or what I don't know but but um certainly I, I I like to think that I'm in my little corner of East Norfolk you know I'm trying to get get more people to be geologists rather than less 
Well, and I think just picking up that, say, from an admissions perspective, okay, I don't do any longer, but up until you know, last year, it was one of the things that came out. We say to people, the number of graduate jobs in earth science related subjects is is pretty significant and it will it yeah. will it will grow. I mean, you say obviously museums, it's it's quite challenging because there's a lot of places that don't get the funding any longer and, it, and it's really difficult. And lots of friends who've gone into museum jobs who've, who found it really hard. And that that's that is a difficult thing to balance because you might love it. But it's it's you know, it can be hard to make a, you know, a good a good sensible kind of living out of it. Um, but actually, you know, more broadly in the sector, there are lots of, of jobs for earth scientists. And the, and the message yes. we had a challenge getting across to people was that if you study it and, and it doesn't have to just be a geology degree, but something of that kind of field, you give yourself opportunities for lots of different careers. And, and the graduates in Hull went off into all sorts of exciting directions. And most of them were not going to go into oil and gas or, or those kind mm. of traditional directions. There were lots of engineering geology, there were lots of environmental geoscience uh, you know lots of sort of um big you know governmental or, or sort of non-government organizations but you know, loads of things out there that, that actually re- require those sorts of skills and i think again one of the important things that probably we've all touched upon is is that it's a sort of subject that actually brings in lots of different skills uh, both you know specific and and general and that can serve you well uh, as well so you know you might find you go off somewhere else but you some of the things you've learned in geology and, and, and paleontology you know serve you put you in good stead so the okay. yeah the challenge is that kind of is you i think emil's touch money primary school kids you know loads of lo- loads of love for kind of fossils and volcanoes and earthquakes and all this earth stuff and then it just sort of kind of not disappears but it, it doesn't get channeled into into things particularly at secondary school because it's hard to to do that within within the subjects and the curriculums and so on and then yeah you get to the point where people are like they've sort of lost the subject a little bit and i think that's one of the big challenges that we face as a as a subject in the broad sense is that we've got lots of people who are interested and there's lots of jobs out there but somehow the kind of the middle bit um <laughs> doesn't quite work at the moment which i think is a is a, a challenge definitely definitely um, yes i think i just want to pick up on something that you both actually alluded to um, through some of the questions and um, also your presentations. Um, and is that that's about uh, transferable skills. Mm. You know, some of those skills that you learn whilst you're at university and okay, you may not necessarily go into that specific role, but those transferable skills that, you know, that you learn at university that no matter what career you end up taking on, on is actually really beneficial. So I was just thinking about um, actually just uh, communication. No matter what you do in life, you've got to communicate with people. Um, you know, Liam, you mentioned about that you really didn't like doing presentations, but as you go um, you know, through your career and different roles, you've got to present whether that's just um, you know, speaking to two or three people um, within in your team to delivering talks in front of um, you know, a whole classroom, a lecture room, or um, you know, in front of your department. Um, or you know working uh, with media and uh, schools as well so I think um, you know like definitely for me that sort of communication side of things and a lot of the um, skills excel (laughs) (laughs) something like something pure basic like that I use excel almost every day in my job (laughs) yes yeah same here same here yeah yeah so yeah is is there any sort of you know those kind of I guess, as I said, transferable skills that you would sort of say that is um, quite important or that you've picked up on and you definitely use almost every day. I didn't realise how much I was going to like working with people. When, when I was when I was a, a recent graduate, I thought uh, my ideal job would have mean would have been I don't know a field geologist in the middle of nowhere. And uh, it wasn't until I actually got in the classroom that. I realised I, I love working with teenagers. They're so funny. And uh, I, I, I don't want to go, as, in case someone's listening, I don't want to say I would, I would do this job for nothing because you know, <laughs> I, I mustn't say that. But, but it is, uh, I, I, I have a good belly laugh every day and I still do. And, and it's, it's just wonderful working with these people. So, so uh, I think I learned a lot about myself by coming into this. But in terms of specific transferable skills, you're absolutely right. And I, I think there's no end to the skill set that you keep on developing, is there? So things like Excel, yeah, absolutely. It's, it's bread and butter for when you're doing things like, I don't know, looking at results that students are getting to try and edge them towards um, where they should be or, or, or whatever. So, so making better use, better use of computers or... Uh, during lockdown, it was everything was on Teams or whatever. There's there's always new stuff, and um, and uh, I I really enjoy making sure that I I wouldn't say that I'm an academic, but I enjoy reading. There you go. 
I, I try and keep up with the basics of what's going <laughs> on in geology. And uh, so, and, and the students enjoy that as well. You know, these come into class and then I really like it that, that they'll get borrowed over a weekend and so on. And, and students like that as well. So I think it's a, it's a sort of combination of keeping yourself upskilled and up to date with what's going on and also making sure that you, you share that enthusiasm with the next generation. Yeah, I think just one of the things I've, I've realised in the last year or so particularly is, is actually there are quite a lot of opportunities in the sort of things that, that we're doing. So, for example, on the Yorkshire coast, we do fossil hunting trips. This summer, I could have done fossil hunting trips four times a day all throughout the summer and, and we'd have sold out probably most, most times. Uh, I obviously can't do that for various reasons. Um, and I suspect there's quite a lot of, of sort of opportunity for these sorts of things, but actually a big part of it is communication. So if there are, I know different people do it in different ways, but there are lots of, of, of kind of communication skills that you can bring in. Um, and I think these sorts of, yeah, communicating the importance of the earth to different audiences is a really important thing. But I actually think in terms of our careers, I think there will be, um, you know, ongoing opportunities to, 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 to do this sort of thing. And I suppose at the moment with people having spent more time kind of at home or, or, or locally there's a bit of that uh, exploration that's been going on that that might then hopefully sort of lead on a bit further where people you know do spend longer looking at their local environment but they'll need somebody to kind of help them with it so I think that's again a big part of the communication yeah. stuff definitely yeah I think that definitely sort of goes back to um especially over the last 18 months, we've all had to find in new ways of adapting and um, overcoming things and often like when one door closes, another door opens and you've got to take those opportunities as and when they come up. So I think that would be a, like a really good piece of advice. It's definitely, yeah, just kind of, if you've got a good opportunity, just go for it because I've, I say I've definitely never regretted things I've done. I've regretted the opportunities that I've not done. Yeah. So yeah, just to go for it. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, thank you, Liam and Ruben, uh, for <laughs> words of wisdom and uh, tell us a little bit more about what um, your jobs uh, involve. Thanks. It's been brilliant. It's been brilliant. Thank you. Thank you all. Yeah. Oh. Thanks so much for, for inviting me to take part. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, that was absolutely fantastic and um, so nice to hear about the varied things that you do and that you've done. Um, Ruben, I don't know if you've seen James has um, put a message to you in the chat box. So if you scroll up a little bit. Um, oh, what about year 10s? Yes. Yes. So yeah, if you yeah, can get that yeah, to yeah. James, um, yeah. Um, the, the easiest thing is just find me on LinkedIn. Find me on LinkedIn and uh, and connect there, and then I can. That, that's probably the easiest way of all. If that's all right. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, well, it's been a brilliant kind of three days, and um, we've had some wonderful um, sessions. All of the speakers have been fantastic. Um, this will all be added to the Geological Society's YouTube channel as a resource. Um, so please, um, if you've missed anything, um, you can scan back through um, and look at the various sessions that we've had and see the kind of varied, um, you know, areas that you can go into in geosciences. Um, so thank you all so much and um, enjoy the rest of your day and have a wonderful weekend. So thank I'll you. This thank down you. Now. So thank you, Becky. Thanks, everyone. Becky. Well done. Thanks for everything. Thanks. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, folks. Thank you.